Good morning, everyone. To the ones we have here with us, many thanks for your presence. Um, hello, Yuan, and all the attendees online. It's a pleasure uh, uh, for me to, to help uh, the today's uh, uh, presentations on competition policy and climate change. We are, we are taking, uh, taking the floor in, in, the, in this kind of specific issues related to, to climate change. I have the pleasure and the honor to introduce my co-director and my close friend, Jeronimo Marillo, uh, who, who will address uh, business cooperation, competition policy, and climate change starting the, the session of, of today. Uh, professor Maillo is a very well-recognized professor on European and international tax law from a long time ago with a long experience. No, tax, no, 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 no as long as me, <laughs> I have to say that, but uh, he's, uh, he's uh, very well knowledge uh, because of, of his publication, uh, his role as, uh, as uh, the director of the competition policy on the uh, of the University Institute of University Studies at the University San Pablo Theo, and I should uh, I should stop now because uh, his CV is so long that I don't want to 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 worry about about that. Uh, Professor Maillo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marta. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I see some uh, faces uh, that I know, Miguel, uh, Silvia, welcome, uh, Joanna, for, of course. Thank you very much for being here um, in this uh, day devoted to competition policy and sustainability. We will be uh, reviewing um, the possibility of uh, agreements uh, uh, that um, restrict competition, but can at the same time promote sustainability, uh, which is the extent to which uh, we can uh, authorize them, we can uh, uh, allow them to happen, or we can even promote it. We will be looking also to unilateral conduct of companies uh, and uh, mergers, and we will be uh, analyzing whether efficiencies, green efficiencies can be taken into account when uh, we do the examination on the competition policy. Um, and we, we will end uh, the, the day in the afternoon with a uh, state debt, uh, with public uh, restrictions of competition and, and the role of, as well of a state debt policy uh, to promote uh, sustainability goals. Um, so, um, my presentation will be on, on Article 101 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, that's to say um, uh, agreements uh, and concerted practice, practices that restrict competition, uh, or that may restrict competition, and at the same time uh, may contribute as well to sustainability goals. What we can call green cooperation. Um, and uh, let me uh, share the, the presentation with you. Okay, so which is the, the main question, the main objectives of, of these uh, first sessions? You have on the slide the, the two main questions. Uh, what I, I'm going to try to uh, answer is to what extent um, business should be allowed to cooperate? To what extent should green cooperation be allowed under Article 101? Of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. Or if, if, if you want to have uh, some examples from the very beginning, uh, to what extent, for, for instance, uh, companies may decide together to phase out some products or methods um, because they are damaging uh, um, sustainability. 
um, even if that implies a certain restriction of, of, of competition. Yeah, uh, it seems that there is there is a technical problem. Uh, two let minutes, or less than less, two minutes. Less, less, sorry. 30 seconds. Uh, you mean to make it uh, smaller? Yes. Maybe so that I can I can fully see yeah. the. That's it. And to. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so, um, what I was. Uh, uh, I was uh, sorry for that. Uh, the, the technical issue is, is already solved. Uh, the, the, the two main questions that I, I wanted to put forward for this session were first, to what extent uh, green cooperation uh, uh, can be uh, admitted, can be uh, said to be compatible with Article 101 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. And I was given some examples. For, for instance, several companies decide to phase out products and methods because they uh, damage uh, sustainability goals. Um, or some companies decide to produce uh, more energy efficiency goods, even if that involves higher prices for consumers and even if that reduces choice. So we allow these agreements under Article 101 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, which prohibits agreements and concerted practices that restrict competition or not. And what can competition authorities, both at European level and national level, do? How can they contribute to facilitate a green cooperation between companies? Um, to start with, um, two, two basic, uh, two basic uh, ideas. Um, the, the first one is that uh, we have to distinguish between um, green wasm and uh, genuine pro-environmental business initiatives. Uh, of course, we, we uh, will be willing to uh, um, pass the first, the, the genuine ones, but we have to pay attention, a lot of attention, to uh, uh, green washing. And I think we have to pay a lot of attention and we have to be in a way a bit of skeptics because um, when the European Commission made uh, the consultation, uh, one of the uh, aspects that, that appear, one of the conclusions that, that appear were that there were no so many real cases uh, uh, of, of genuine agreements. Um, and on the other hand, we know that there is a tendency or there might be a tendency to collusion with uh, uh, very negative spillovers on competition if, if we are too flexible. So we have to keep that in mind and we have to do all what is possible within Article 101 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union and within competition policy to facilitate this green cooperation, but at the same time, be conscious of, of this risk. Um, I, I will say that we have to take into account green efficiencies. I, I don't have doubts about that. What I think is more difficult is, is to uh, know to what extent 
with what scope we can take into consideration those, those green efficiencies. Or if you want how, how we can adjust, how we can adapt Article 101, how, how we can interpret Article 101 to uh, include those green efficiencies and which are the problems and difficulties that we may find when doing it. Um, I have put some, some premises, some general premises that I think that we, we should not forget. Um, and more, many of them ap apply not only to Article 101, but for the whole day, I think, for, for the uh, uh, whole uh, debate uh, of interaction between competition policy and sustainability. The first, the first one, of course, is that uh, we have a big challenge. Uh, uh, we have to face the, the challenge of climate change. And uh, it, there is an emergency, no doubt that it is very serious, uh, probably is the biggest challenge we have uh, nowadays. Uh, uh, so that's the departing, the departure point. Uh, with such a big challenge, we have to take into consideration to, to use all tools and all policies that uh, we can uh, we can uh, utilize, uh, and not only not only specifically environmental policy, that of course, but there is a horizontal mandate on Article One uh, on Article Eleven uh, for also considering sustainability goals in all the other policies. So we have there a legal mandate. Um, another idea that I think is important is that action by governments uh, is not enough. Governments can do a lot, but they cannot do everything. So it would be good to encourage business to invest, and uh, to promote as well sustainability goals. Which is then the role of, of competition? Uh, I think there is a certain consensus um, on the scholars and also on competition authorities that competition policy is not the most important policy to face uh, climate change. It, it, it will play more a supportive role or if you want a complementary role. Um, that regulation is often a better, a more important tool. Um, so uh, that's, I think, important also to be, to be considered. Also because if we are too lenient in competition, that might uh, go against the use of regulation and regulation might be a better tool and therefore that, that might, might be negative uh, at the very end. We also have to take into consideration that sustainability is becoming more and more a driver for competition as well. So companies compete as well on uh, their green reputation, their green innovation, um, their, their green uh, products, the quality, the green quality of their products and, and services. So sustainability is becoming more and more that important driver. And therefore, we have to promote it. And if, 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 if we um, flexibilize uh, the application of competition policy, we may be at the very end having uh, 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 as well a negative impact because we will be disincentivizing uh, that, that uh, um, driver. So, uh, that's something that uh, should uh, call our attention. Um, important is as well to, to know that competition authorities are not well placed to make very controversial political value judgments, um, for instance, between higher prices and social objectives. Uh, competition policies are, competition authorities are usually technical bodies. Um, they have not been uh, elected. Um, usually a legislator or even a government will be in a better position to make this type of decisions, which are not merely technical, but more political, okay? It is true 
that we have here a different situation at national level and at European level, because at national level, these uh, competition authorities are very technical. Um, and at the European level, formally at least, the decision is taken by the college, by the European Commission. And that's not so technical. There is only one commissioner for competition and the rest are usually politicians. Uh, um, it's a very special college, but still, I think there is a difference there between uh, national level and, and EU, European level. Um, in practice, at the European level, decisions on competition uh, tend to be very technical as well, uh, and, uh, and therefore do not include this type of political value judgments as a general as a general rule. And the last premise I want to uh, uh, set up is that uh, the importance for for business uh, of having legal certainty. Um, and legal certainty in competition policy, uh, at least regarding uh, this green cooperation, can be attained through different means. One of them will be uh, block exemption regulation that will give a lot of legal certainty. Uh, another one will be soft uh, law, mainly, mainly guidelines, um, not as important or as uh, much legal certainty as uh, a block extension regulation, but still uh, it will uh, give uh, important, I think, um, guidance to companies. So what is considered to be compatible with Article 101 and what is not. Um, this is extremely important for business. And I think we are missing this uh, legal certainty nowadays. Um, and that's a problem. It's a problem that the commission has detected. And of course, is working on it. It has launched, as many of you know, a uh, uh, large consultation on, on these issues and is now um, uh, exploring the, rev the review of, of the block, both the block extension regulation and also the guidance, the guidelines on horizontal cooperation between companies. Um, and at the very end of the presentation, I will be uh, entering into that draft and, and uh, making a first analysis, preliminary analysis of what I think is the position that the commission is taking regarding these this, uh, issues. But we cannot forget that although legal certainty is very important, if you do not have sufficient um, experience for certain cases, uh, it might be better to be cautious and it might be better to go or, or, or try to solve on a case by case basis and, until at, at least you get that sufficient experience. Um, uh, so the risk of bad guidelines uh, might also uh, be uh, taken into account. Okay, so what can competition authorities do? And I have three, three possibilities. Uh, theoretical possibilities that I would like to explore. Uh, what I will be doing is to explore each of these three to, to uh, uh, try to give some ideas about what is the debate. And then I will, uh, I will look into the guidelines and, and try to understand what is the position of the commission regarding some of these uh, possible options. Um, the, the first option um, that I just, I just wanted to, to comment briefly um, not enter too much into the detail, although we can, we can also look at it later on in the debate, is um, priori prioritize, uh, is to prioritize uh, the cases that the competition authorities um, uh, have the possibility to, to tackle or to investigate. 
both at the European level and at national level, competition authorities have a big discretion for uh, setting priorities. Uh, at the European level, since the 90s, in case Automec, um, the Court of Justice gave uh, a lot of discretion to, to the Commission to decide whether to investigate or not a case, not only it's in its own motion, but also the possibility to uh, reject a complaint <clears throat> or not to proceed with a complaint. Why? Without, a, um, a, 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 let's say, a, a material ground, but it, it, the Commission may say that it simply is not one of its priorities and explain why it's not one of its priorities. And it might be because national courts, for instance, can deal with it or competition, national competition authorities can deal with it. Uh, so other bodies, or it might be because uh, the case is not uh, very important from a qualitative or uh, um, um, uh, quantitative uh, point of view or because um, uh, the companies have already uh, ceased the uh, uh, anti-competitive conduct or many other reasons. It's an open list. So a big discretion for the European Commission to decide. And national competition, of this, this has been uh, um, um, explained uh, further on on the, uh, on the Commission's notice on handling of, of complaints. Um, and if you read them, you will see that this, this discretion is, is, is very large. Um, although it is subject to uh, uh, judicial view, but still is very large. What about national competition authorities? Um, since the uh, ECM plus directive, Article 4, Paragraph 5, all competition authorities at national level have also this possibility to prioritize. Um, and how to prior prioritize, which are the criteria to prioritize is something that will be fixed at national level, mainly at national level. Um, they, there might be uh, guidelines from the uh, competition authority itself, in some cases even from governments. Um, um, and of course then the discretion may change between one national competition authority and another, okay? But anyway, what the ACN Plus Directive says is that there should be an important uh, discretion, an, an important possibility to set priorities as well at national level. Once we have set up this, I put to you two scenarios. The first one is what I call more competition. So we have an agreement, a cooperation that uh, is uh, detrimental to both competition and sustainability. Um, for instance, it blocks or delay green innovation. So it's blocking innovation that's restrictive of competition and at the same time is, is, is blocking or delaying green innovation. So it's contrary to sustainability goals. Um, how can the competition authorities use their possibility to, to set priorities here? But I will say that they can um, strict, uh, enforce the rules, in particular Article 101, more strictly. Um, uh, and I see no problem at all in this practice. Uh, the only theoretical, hypothetical objection that may that I can think of is um, in unequal treatment with other cases. Um, but due to the larger discretion that has been given to the commute to the uh, to the competition authorities by the Court of Justice, I think that that claim will will not be successful. Um, always provided, of course, that there is a, a adequate, appropriate uh, ground uh, and a motivation by the European Commission or the competition national authorities. But, but, I, but, I, but I think this is perfectly possible. Um, and, and evidence of, of this is that um, already at the European Commission, for instance, is 
certain priorities and is very much is, is very much active in certain sectors and not in others and no one is complaining about uh, uh, about unequal treatment because it's I mean everyone understands that setting priorities is, is precisely that so I think this will be a possibility to intervene for the competition authorities and to promote sustainability goals without um, any objection. Um, and I think that the, the, the competition authorities are in the mood to do, to do this, uh, and they will be more in the next uh, years. Uh, the second scenario is what I call less competition, and that's much more controversial. Uh, the idea is that a competition authority doesn't investigate or doesn't proceed with uh, the investigation of an agreement that restricts competition because it's a genuine green business cooperation. Um, and this particularly will be a, a, a more sensible scenario when there is a consensus on, on that cooperation, a broad social support for that cooperation, uh, particularly if all the stakeholders have been uh, behind that cooperation and are supporting and that cooperation. Um, there might also be pub even public authorities involved uh, and, and supporting that, although they have not taken the regulatory measure. So, um, in such a scenario, we may wonder whether the competition authorities should use or can use and should use uh, their possibility to set priorities to uh, not intervene. Um, and well, first, first caveat here is that uh, this has not been uh, um, uh, confirmed. This possibility has not been confirmed by by courts, at least not on the ground that there is a, a genuine green, green business cooperation behind. Uh, it's true that the competition authorities may uh, decide not to investigate because of other reasons on other grounds. Uh, and if that's the case, um, they will be able to do it and it will be very difficult to stop them to do it. But a different, different thing is whether they should or not do it. Um, and we, we may uh, discuss this later on in the debate. Um, in certain occasions, I think that, for, for, for instance, I, I can imagine a case in which the um, uh, there are some uh, restrictions of competition, but at the same time, there are uh, also green efficiencies. Um, and in such a case, should a competition authority intervene? Or should just tolerate the, 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 the cooperation? I, I would say that in a way, we may also defend it might be a priority for that competition authority to clarify which is the possibility under Article 101 to cooperate. Because now there is a lot of uncertainty. So if you have one of these cases, couldn't it be better to intervene and decide? Um, is, is that setting rightly the priorities for a competition authority? Is, isn't that better than just tolerate the agreement? Again, this is anyway, very controversial. Um, and um, we will see uh, for sure um, in the future, uh, more debate about, about this. The second option is um, the so-called exclusion route. We do not uh, uh, apply 
Article 101, Paragraph 1, with this, because we, we consider that the agreement is not restrictive of competition. And here we have uh, several possibilities. Um, the first one is, well, those, those agreements that uh, imply a cooperation or not related to competition parameters, so for, for, or which are far from the market. For, for instance, agreements on, for promoting consumer awareness or for uh, um, improving transparency about the green character of the products in the sector, or um, incentivizing responsible corporate conduct, or uh, creating uh, a database about environmental effects of the products of the sector. Um, I think those type of agreements may not fall under Article 101, Paragraph 1, because uh, they are far or for sufficiently far from the market and uh, well, in most cases, uh, and therefore uh, uh, we may uh, use this exclusion route and, and allow these sustainability agreements. A second possibility will, will be to use the case law Wouters and Mecca Medina, you already uh, you all know this, this uh, case law, uh, it basically say that uh, if there is a legitimate uh, aim uh, and the measure is proportionate, then there will be no violation of Article 101, Paragraph 1. Uh, it is true that Butters is uh, it's a decision of the Dutch uh, bar, uh, uh, make a decision, a decision uh, 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 some rules of the International Olympic Committee about doping. Um, um, Wouters was referring to uh, um, um, the ontological rules and the integrity of the profession and prohibited um, the uh, partnerships between lawyers and uh, auditors uh, for, for protecting that, that integrity of, of the process of the profession. Um, so very, very specific fields. But some people have said, well, we have Butters and Mecca Medina, why not to use this for other uh, uh, fields and particularly for sustainability uh, agreements? Of course, the doubt here is, well, why only the environment and not other goals? Um, uh, to what extent we can use this, this case law? Because if, if we open too much the door, then uh, we will oblige the competition authority to make politically political judgments uh, and a balance between uh, uh, competition uh, and efficiencies and also other social uh, aims. And uh, again, I, I don't think the competition authorities are the very, very well placed for, for doing that. Um, is much more uh, a role of, of the legislator or, or, or of the government than, than the competition authorities. But uh, that's there. Uh, another possibility will be to use uh, another type, another line of case law. Um, it's uh, Albany, Paulov, uh, and I have uh, quoted on this slide, uh, oh, one or, or another case in the, of this line, the Constance Informatia and Media uh, case, uh, in which the court clearly stated that collective bargaining between employers and employees intended to improve employment and working condition is out of the scope of Article 101, Paragraph 1. So some people again have argued, well, we can apply this by analogy and we can exclude agreements. Um, in which there is a participation and consensus of stakeholders. Of course, the stakeholders here will have to be much larger, much broader, producers, employers, employees, consumers, NGOs, agreements that improve sustainability. And it may be that the Court of Justice may decide to support uh, this by analogy. The truth is that Nowadays, we don't have that support. And that would be very risky, uh, of course, uh, to use it without that support. 
uh, could, could we exclude that um, an ASEAN court will refer the case to the Court of Justice asking precisely that because a lawyer has uh, argued this before uh, in a national proceeding? No, I, I don't think we can exclude it. Um, um, again, I think collective bargaining is a very uh, special field, but I, 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 I don't dare to exclude completely this, this possibility and, and not even the, the support of the Court of Justice. And of course, um, you have combinations of different options. You, you may combine certain priorities with one of these routes, for instance, the exclusion route, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and decide as one of the priorities because there is a social support of this type that you will not intervene. Um, and that's within the uh, possibilities of, of competition authorities. Uh, those that defend this said that the main advantage is that there is no need of cost-benefit analysis. And that's true. It's much easier, much uh, easy to decide these cases. But on the other hand, not making these cost-benefit analysis may have also uh, a negative impact, of course, um, uh, in, because at the very end, you are not uh, taking into account the certain certain aspects. Um, okay, so this is the second option. The third option is 101 paragraph three, the uh, exception route or the exemption route, if you want. And uh, again, some scholars are, and some competition authorities are also, particularly at national level, I think the most representative case is the Dutch authority. Uh, they uh, advocate for a widening or reinterpretation of the uh, exceptions. Uh, um, wh which are the possibilities? Well, to give more importance to non-price um, efficiencies, to give more importance to qualitative efficiencies. Qualitative efficiencies are already there uh, and they, they are already in Article 101, Paragraph 3. Uh, but the idea will be to give more uh, weight to these qualitative efficiencies and particularly to green efficiencies. Um, of course, here the problem is how to measure, how to quantify those qualitative efficiencies. We have a certain experience already in Article 101, Paragraph 3, for instance, with regard to innovation. Um, um, but I think we, we, we have to make more studies. And I, I know that also environmental uh, economics is looking very much into this and trying to, to uh, identify good, good mechanisms to quantify uh, these efficiencies. The second point, the second possibility to widen up this uh, exception will be looking into the time frame. Uh, not, not only short term, but also medium long term, and therefore making a more dynamic uh, assessment of, of, the, uh, of the case and all the, the circumstances. Um, uh, I think that's, that's, that's a, a possibility, but of course it has to be applied um, in a general manner. So uh, we will have to explain uh, uh, why we are uh, uh, applying this medium long term and only short term uh, and why we are doing this dynamic assessment uh, and we, we have to uh, use it not only for sustainability goals but for all, all the cases okay um, that in sustainability uh, for sustainability goals we may have more possibilities maybe of that dynamic assessment? I think that's possible, okay? Um, and of course, the big debate is uh, on uh, which efficiencies we can take into account. What is the meaning of first share for consumers? One of the uh, conditions of 101 paragraph three um, and the condition of indispensability and how this condition may also um, 
be applied in the context of sustainability goals. Um, no problem with in-market efficiencies. The main problem regarding efficiencies, the first condition of 101 paragraph three is out of market efficiencies, whether we can take them into account or not, because the, what the commission has been saying traditionally is that uh, we can also only take into account uh, in market efficiencies uh, and to a very limited extent out of market efficiencies. When some conditions, some very strict conditions are met, when the group of consumers in the market uh, is overlapping with the group of consumers which is receiving some efficiencies out of the market. If this, there, there is that overlap and some other conditions are met, then the commission is open to take into consideration as well that out of market efficiencies are only partially. Um, uh, here there are claims of uh, taking much more into consideration out, out of market efficiencies. Um, another condition um, uh, is that the uh, consumer has to receive a fair share of the benefits of the cooperation. Um, and the meaning of fair share is also um, controversial. Um, is it, does it mean full compensation in that market? or taking into account that market and other markets? What is exactly the meaning? The traditional understanding was full compensation, taking into account both in and out of market efficiencies. Um, so could, could we be more flexible there and, 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 and not require that full compensation? Um, and the third, uh, line uh, is or regards the indispensability condition. Um, he, uh, here, I, th I think there, is, there are some, some possible interesting arguments. The first one is urgency. Um, climate change uh, is something that we have to solve and we have to solve quickly. Um, so some, some uh, corporations that might not be uh, uh, admitted in other cases because there's no urgency might be in uh, regarding climate change because we have to act and we have to achieve results uh, more quickly. I, th I think that enters into the uh, framework of uh, Article 101, Paragraph 3. Okay. Um, so these time frame considerations, I think, uh, have or may, may be taken into account. And also the first mover disadvantage. Um, uh, if uh, at the very end to achieve the results, we need to take, uh, we need that cooperation because otherwise the first mover will not give the first step uh, and therefore the results will not ap appear. We may take that into account also within the indispensability condition. I think that that's also po a possibility. And, and there are a lot of cases of first mover disadvantage in sustainability cases. So how to manage these, these, these options? Um, I'm already starting to give you my personal view about, about this. Um, of course, you don't have to, to just choose one. You may choose a mix of them. Uh, um, ECS one is for sure to set priorities, particularly the more competition scenario, I think uh, raises no doubts. Um, and uh, second, uh, cooperation not related to competition parameters in Article 101, I think there, there is a room for action and for clarification and for guidance. Um, and I think that uh, my, uh, promote certain types of, of agreement, particularly standardization agreements, uh, higher standards, higher environmental standards. Um, other exclusions of 101 uh, and flexibilization of 101 paragraph three 
my, my view, my initial view will be Caucasian, but studying uh, and exploring the cases. Um, I, I will be particularly cautious with 101 paragraph one. I think uh, uh, using Butters or Mecca Medina uh, for this is not the right option. Um, the other cases, um, uh, I mean, Albani, Paulov. I think it's also a very specific film, but I have more doubts about what the Court of Justice will do there. Um, I, th I, I, I think that when we apply this, we have to make a reflection on the general impact on, on, on all cases, all 101 cases. Uh, and that's, that's the reason why I think we have to be cautious. Um, we need general guidance, uh, and I think the Commission has uh, been right in launching this uh, ex ante consultation and preparing the draft for, for, for new general guidance. Um, and I, I will, if we have not cleared the, the situation, I will prefer to apply case by case. Uh, so limited guidance, limited general guidance, and apply case by case to gain experiences. It's true that we, we need to act, and how we can act is to facilitate that the companies approach the competition authorities and consult their doubts about corporations. I think that's very important if, if we want to adopt just a limited guidance. Because one of the main problems for those business for those businesses now might be that they don't know what to do in certain, in certain occasions, uh, whether they can, to what extent they can cooperate, and they don't have an easy uh, um, approach to the competition authorities. If we look um, uh, into the draft, uh, horizontal, guidelines there are references some references to the exclusion route and to the uh, uh, exception route um, and um, my my interpretation uh, of course I'm, I'm open to to debate is that there's there's no support uh, no not a big support to the exclusion route except for standardization agreements um, in paragraph uh, uh, 548, the, com the commission says clearly that having a green objective is not enough to uh, exclude the application of Article 101. Um, but it's true that at the same time, it says that if it has a genuine green objective, that could not be a restriction by object. So it is taken into account. Uh, the, uh, the, the this this sustainability genuine sustainability uh, objective, okay, but it's not excluding the application of Article One Hundred One just because there is a green objective in the agreement. Second, there is a reference to Butters, uh, but it's a, in a footnote, um, and it, in in the footnote, in addition, it frames the exception only for professional regulations. Uh, there is no other reference to any other case law, so like Albany or Pavlov. So it doesn't seem that the commission is supporting this, this route. What I think is very interesting, apart from saying that there is no restriction by object if there is a genuine green objective, which already is, I think, interesting, is uh, section nine about, about sustainability agreements. Uh, and in particular, um, the safe harbor for standardization agreements, if certain conditions are met, the standardization agreement, cooperation to uh, raise standards, environmental standards by business will not fall under article 101 paragraph one. So this is the exclusion route. Um, and which are the, those conditions? First, they are very strict. 
but, but, but this is very useful guidance and I think that will be very used by companies. Um, I, I think here we have a big step forward. F first, that the procedure, the procedure to create the standard has to be transparent um, and open to all uh, possible operators in the market. Uh, the second one is that the standards should not be binding. So some operators may participate, some others may decide not to participate. The third one is that even those that participate may uh, in the future uh, raise their, their, their standards, not lower them, but raise them. So they should be remain free to do it. The fourth is that uh, businesses should not exchange commercially sensitive inf information beyond what is necessary for that standardization agreement. Um, fifth, the classical uh, uh, condition on uh, access, effective and non-discriminatory uh, uh, access to the standard. Um, sixth, and this is uh, the most difficult maybe uh, condition to, to, met, to meet is that uh, this does not apply if there is a significant increase in price or a significant reduction in the choice of the product. Um, I stress that it has to be a significant increase or reduction. And we don't know what significant is. Uh, depending on how you interpret this, uh, this condition might be more or less difficult to comply with. Um, and this is a very interesting point, I think, for, for next cases. Um, and finally, that there should be a monitoring system. If all, all these conditions are met, then there is no uh, problem with uh, paragraph one of Article 101 that the business cooperation is admitted. I, I think this is going to be very much used by, by businesses. And the, the most problematic, I insist, is condition six. And what about uh, the exception route? My general impression is that there is not a big change. For instance, it's very significant that there is no uh, intention of the European Commission to uh, adopt new guidelines on the interpretation of Article 101, Paragraph 3. Of course, if, if you would like to reinterpret Article 101, Paragraph 3 and the conditions of 101, Paragraph 3, or propose a new interpretation, um, I think you should uh, uh, go for these new guidelines. So uh, on the other hand, I think uh, the Commission is referring to that guidelines on Article 101, Paragraph 3, the existing one. Okay? But there is a moderate uh, consideration of uh, some of the debates that I have announced before. For instance, clearly qualitative efficiencies can be taken into account. And this is even more, this is clearer than before, paragraph uh, 577. Uh, and there is a broad spectrum of qualitative efficiencies that are mentioned for sustainability goals uh, in, in paragraph uh, 577. 78, open list. Um, explicit reference to the first moving disadvantage regarding the dispensability condition. Um, I would like also to, stre to stress that the commission refers not only to direct uh, benefits or efficiencies, but also to indirect benefits or efficiencies. Um, um, and there is a section there is a, 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 a subsection on collective benefits. Um, um, it's true that with a lot of caution, only if markets are, this is basically out of market efficiencies and more collective ones, not individual ones. And the commission is open to take that into account if markets are related, if there is a substantial overlap between the groups of consumer in both markets. And if there is a large coverage, so that the green effects will likely materialize. Um, for instance, that will be the case in a cooperation between uh, uh, drivers, companies, 
uh, uh, regarding uh, polluting fuel, and, and you have here uh, a, a collective, uh, in, in addition to the uh, uh, individual benefit for those drivers, you have a, a also a collective, a, a collective one because they are also citizens, so they they will benefit for uh, better air, um, and of, of course if that materialize that like is likely to materialize, and that can be taken into account. Okay, but in other cases, it will not be possible to take that into account because the conditions will not be met. Like, for instance, the case of consumers that buy clothing made of sustainable cotton that reduces chemicals and water use on the land where it is cultivated because they're here, the, the, the direct benefit, beneficiaries will, will not be those, those consumers in the market, in the European market, but abroad. Uh, we will be only take, uh, uh, be possible to take that into account if they are willing to pay more for that for that product. So you see a limited um, or more or broader, let's say, reference to uh, some of the debates, which in a way may announce the possibility of um, more use as well of 101 paragraph three in this field, um, certain uh, re interpretation of certain conditions or broadening of, of some of those conditions. Um, I, I can think of all, all, all other de debates that may enter, even if they are not explicitly mentioned of the ones that we, we, we uh, mentioned before. But this is uh, my first analysis of the draft uh, with regard to these, these, these questions. And, um, and that's all. Thank you very much. And uh, of course, I'm uh, available for questions and, uh, and comments. I look, I, I look forward to, to that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Genonimo. Very interesting overview and options and problems, challenges, is everything uh, on, on, on the floor not only on competition policies, but uh, in, 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 other, in other policies. Uh, I, I uh, found very interesting that you mentioned uh, cer uh, certainty, legal certainty is, is a must, always is a must. And, and simplify approach to, to, to the law for, for having this cooperation, this, this needed cooperation for green projects. But on the other hand, you have mentioned significant and other kind of this expression like are always in defined legal concepts. How to, to, to move this, this specific barrier on, 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 on that uh, issue. You, you mentioned there will be so many options and so many combination of, of options, but uh, to me, uh, the, the companies don't, don't have really this legal certainty, even if the modernization process is on table and even if uh, the commission uh, wanted to, to, to promote this, uh, this legal certainty with, with the guidelines. I don't know if you agree with my, my perspective or, or you, you are more optimistic about uh, 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 engaging uh, enterprises in this kind of uh, cooperation for, for green projects. This, this is my, my view and thanks for your presentation. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, Marta, for, for uh, uh, this question, which I think is, uh, is true. It's very, very important. Legal certainty is very important. Um, and uh, I agree with you that we are missing. Nowadays, we are missing legal certainty on this issue. Um, how to acquire that legal certainty? Um, we have certain limitations because we don't have sufficient experience. And if we don't have sufficient experience, uh, as, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, we risk to make bad guidance, bad guidelines, which will be worse. Um, um, so 
I think, I think uh, that we should be cautious. And yes, we should expand to, this, to the uh, standard that is possible and reasonable, these, these guidelines. Uh, we should include uh, more detailed reasoning uh, for, for business on how to interpret uh, Article 101, Paragraph 1, and Paragraph 3. But to the extent that that's possible and that we have already uh, or sufficient experience or sufficient conviction that what we are saying is right. And we have to create uh, a channel, a specific channel for companies to approach the competition authorities to gain that legal certainty in individual cases. Um, I think that's, that's also very, very important. We have uh, seen um, uh, this in the uh, pandemia with the coronavirus, uh, in which uh, the doors were open for the competition of, for the businesses to the competition authorities to consult whether in the very special circumstances of the pandemia, they could uh, do some cooperations that in other scenarios will have not been possible. Um, and to consult their specific case and to have a statement of the commission saying, yes, you can do it, uh, even if it's informal, that will give sufficient legal certainty to business. And if that is public, uh, then also this will give uh, guidance to other companies, other businesses that want to engage in green cooperation. Um, and of course, if if we gain sufficient experience and then we can change again or uh, uh, adjust and update the, the general guidelines, right. But um, I I'm concerned about uh, not being cautious with, with that. I, I, pre I prefer also the case-by-case -case analysis in certain issues to gain, to gain that, that experience, but certainly legal certainty and, and uh, more guidance to companies in one way or another is needed. And we have, we have to uh, channel, channel this, uh, this concern of, of business because we, we, we need business in, in, the, in this task. Okay. Thank you very much. Now it's time to, to you for making questions. I don't know if uh, you here and would you please take, take the time. How, do, how much time do we have? Because I have like a million questions. <laughs> ah. Oh, yeah, okay. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. Okay. So um, I have some, as you know me, I have some metaphysical or philosophical observations, but also some more legal, technical ones. So maybe I'll start with the legal ones because they're more straightforward. Uh, can you put the PowerPoint presentation, please? I think your second slide or your third slide. The, the first option, the enforcement priorities. Or if not, it's not a problem, no? Okay. Okay, you, you, we all have it in our minds. So I think that's probably the, the best chance right now without some major overhaul of the rules. Um, because as you point out, um, the commission has pretty considerable discretion in deciding which cases to pursue and not to pursue. And it is only subject to review in so far as it rejects an individual case. But, but that is a relatively sort of narrow standard. Um, and also there is not a lot of transparency in what the commission decides to pursue or not. Um, and on the, other, on the other hand, I think that a lot of people sort of consider the commission a technical um, sort of institution and in, in a great, um, in, a, in many ways it is, and it presents itself as such, but I think that it also exercises inevitably some degree of political leadership and uh, normative sort of decision-making. Uh, and it ranks uh, values and goals consistently. It's, it's unavoidable. Um, in fact, the institutional setup is such that the commission, as you point out, 
um, sets out political priorities. And I think the current ones were set by Ursula von der Leyen in 2019 when she was running. And I think they include something like, I think there's like six goals. And at least one of those is sustainability. One of them is digital. One of them is a Europe that works for the people that can also be interpreted broadly. So there are political goals. And then DG Comp, um, the issue management plan that it's never been clear to me whether they sort of repackage competition policy and show how it connects with those goals and say, yeah, yeah, competition is good for all of this. And if it's more of a sort of rhetoric or if that management plan says, well, listen, you know, you've said that digital is important. So now we're going to do something. And in fact, the DMA was passed in this period when digital was um, sort of established as one of the six priorities by Ursula von der Leyen. So I think that it is embedded sort of in the treaties and in the institutional setup and the legal setup of the European Union that the commission should exercise some sort of political leadership, even though it succeeds often in being technical, but I think that political decisions are inevitable. Uh, so I think that that's probably the best option. I think that the other two options are run into serious legal obstacles. Um, so as far as not applying Article 101, sorry, Article 101, Paragraph 1, um, the problem with the line of case law is, as far as I know, Mecca Medina that requires a proportionality test, um, as you later suggest, is limited only to um, one type of uh, agreement. It's not, um, it cannot be extrapolated to sustainability, as far as I know, unless somebody can point me to that case law that, that does that. And then as far as the other line of case law that sort of Albany and so on, that says there are certain legitimate interests that Trump, that may Trump competition, um, I'm also not sure if those have been applied to sustainability. Um, so an issue that you might run in there are the courts, as you suggest. And maybe it's easier to square sort of collective bargaining agreements with the social market economy of the European Union principle, right? So I think that the problem there would be that the courts and the law, basically. As far as 101.3 goes, um, I think that there have been cases like CCD, if I'm not mistaken, where environmental concerns have been considered. It's never certain or 100% certain how much they weigh. If it's um, sort of, you know, a decisive factor or if it's just another one of the factors, but if it doesn't matter, then why would the commission mention sustainability in a case like CECD? Um, the problem again with that is that after the more economic approach, sort of the scope of arguing outside of economic efficiencies, dynamic efficiency, productive efficiency is very, very limited. Even one on one three cases based on economic efficiencies are difficult, let alone on something else. Um, and then for better or for worse, we're tied to the consumer welfare standard. So if you wanted any reform to succeed on that front, you would have to show how sustainability benefits consumers, not citizens, not animals, not chickens, not dolphins, but consumers. Um, which brings me to the philosophical point, which is to what extent is it meaningful to try and square sustainability and competition law? Because the sort of the telos, the goal of competition law is to um, prevent restrictions of competition that reduce output and therefore increase prices, right? That harm consumers in that way. Um, it is a relatively narrow standard, but sort of the direction is, is clear. Uh, more stuff good, lower prices uh, good, right? And sustainability, you know, there is a case to be made, made for degrowth from a sustainability perspective, right? So to, to what point is it possible to square a sort of capitalistic economy that encourages and prizes entrepreneurship and um, the constant maximization of output and production of more and more with sustainability goals that say some of this production might be bad for the planet? Maybe a, a shift in sort of the subject that is at the core of competition law is, is required from consumer to something else. Or perhaps, as you suggest, maybe we need to expand the time frame. but I'm not sure that even then you could connect consumer welfare with sustainability. Um, because as I say, consumer welfare is generally associated with lower prices. And I think that this is reflected in the guidelines. And let me just finish. I know I'm going on for too long. <laughs> um, I warned you. <laughs> so yeah, today I saw an ad by ESSO, you know, the company, the uh, gas, company and you know it was a father going to pick up his child on a bicycle and going back home on that bicycle and the child was surprised why is my father picking me up on a bicycle um, so 
you know, this is a, a gas company that wants you to use less of its product and ride a bicycle, right? So I'm wondering whether um, it is possible that sort of the market itself, and this is contrary to the other point that I made that the tour may be incompatible. Maybe, the, maybe there is competition for sustainability. Maybe it's greenwashing, but maybe companies are actively competing to be more sustainable. I mean, if ESSO is telling people to use a bicycle, it's ESSO, right? Um, so I was thinking that maybe the, the first mover disadvantage is not insurmountable. Maybe it's even an advantage in a, in a market economy in which companies sort of seek to, um, you know, connect with user tastes. Now, it's the question is whether this sort of they're sort of connecting with a niche taste of a very small group of people that is uh, conscious about sustainability, because I still think that probably 90% of consumers you know, don't care. They want the cheap stuff. Um, but my question is, can the market resolve this? Can there be competition for sustainability? Um, maybe there's other ways than competition policy and all of this sort of to resolve this issue. Maybe the, the market can do it in some way. So yeah, those are my <laughs> 10,000 questions, maybe more observations. I really liked your presentation and it's, it's really updated me because um, sustainability is not something that I'm very, very much into. Um, but um, yeah, you've put me up to date and I'm very thankful for that. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lazar. It's, it's, uh, it's very, very interesting uh, comments and, and questions. Um, I some I'm, I can take the other. I can take the other. That's okay. Thank you. Okay, so um, I was saying thank, thank you very much for, for, for your comments and, uh, and questions. Um, very briefly, you have uh, put a lot of uh, issues on the table. Um, you said, well, um, regarding, regarding the, the exclusive route, um, as, as I said, I, I, I fully agree with you there, uh, Butters, should be or it's limited now to regulation of profession or similar that's Buters, Mecca Medina, uh, unless the, the court of justice broadens up that uh, I think uh, we cannot use this for uh, for sustainability goals in general okay um, the other one uh, Albany Paulov you said well maybe that explanation there is the that, that is related to the social market economy. Um, I have more doubts there because environment and then fight against climate change in a way is part also of that sustainable market economy, which is one of the main goals of the, and is written in the treaties. So if, if you consider social market economy and, and you, justify collective bargaining uh, exclusion from 101 paragraph one because it's social market economy or is promoting social market economy so then we do or so then we open as well the possibility for sustainable market economy which is as important as social market economy i think within the treaties and nowadays so your justification uh, i think there is not uh, I mean, convincing in a way, uh, although I understand uh, uh, that uh, and this doesn't mean that I am in favor, fully in favor of, of the Court of Justice saying we extend Albany to sustainability uh, 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 regulation or soft regulation, okay? But the justification, I think, is, 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 not, uh, is not convincing. Second comment, uh, you, you mentioned the more economic approach, uh, and it's true, uh, and this is particularly true regarding Article 101, Paragraph 3, uh, uh, after uh, 2000, and particularly 2004, um, the more economic approach, uh, uh, and, and 
there was, a, I would say, an institutional interest of the European Commission on limiting the debate to technical arguments or to economic arguments because there was a decentralization of the enforcement of Article 101. And not only the European Commission, but all the competition authorities and all the, uh, the national courts were going to be able to apply the early 101 paragraph three uh, and, and say this complies with the four conditions of, of 101 paragraph three. So uh, at that moment, it was extremely important, of course, to limit the interpretation of 101 paragraph three to that uh, uh, to, to a more technical technical I I interpretation. I, I, I fully agree. But that doesn't mean that within efficiencies and the other conditions, so within technical arguments, you can open a bit the interpretation. And I think that's what the commission is, in a way, is doing. Uh, I mean, it's within those technical arguments, without uh, saying, well, I will consider uh, uh, promotion of employment or uh, cultural values or, you know, which is the efficiency? Tell me which is the efficiency, quantify it, give me evidence about it. And if you do it, and it's for the consumer, um, then I will take it into account. But it's a limited reinterpretation or adaptation, always within what is technical. Um, um, you say, you said, well, consumers, only consumers. I see in the draft a, big, a small change, a slight change there, because the commission says, well, those consumers are at the same time citizens. And if they are, and some, some benefits they may obtain it because they are consumers, but some of them may, they may obtain it because they are citizens. And those benefits that are obtained as citizens, if there's an identity between the, the persons can be taken into account. That's not changing the consumer welfare standard, uh, but it is taking some more into account. Or maybe you will say this is in a way, yes, uh, readjusting the consumer welfare standard and we are change, changing the paradigm in, in, in competition law. I think it's a bit of a paradigm shift if you extend it to citizens because everything affects citizens. Inequality, sustainability, uh, politics, media plurality. Then you open the floodgates to um, an infinity. Of but it's only for those. Only for sustainability? O no, only for, for those consumers which are the same time citizens. Mm -hmm. You are not considering all the other citizens. It's only them who, who have a double heart. They are consumers and at the same time, they are citizens. Right. And so, so you are taking into account the, the, the benefits, the individual benefits. Mm -hmm. You are taking into account as well if they are willing to pay more for those products, of course. Uh, and you may also take into account some benefits that are obtained because they are in a collectivity because they are citizens, because it's a benefit that uh, is applicable or th that uh, is gained by all citizens of that, for, for instance, of that city, okay? Uh, but you only take into account the benefits for those consumers as citizens, not for the whole population of the city. So it's, in a way, I mean, you, the commission is maintaining what was saying before, uh, 
if there's an overlap, if there's an identity between the consumers here, the consumers there, you may take into account a certain extent also out of market efficiencies with certain limitations, okay? And finally, with regard to the first mover uh, disadvantage, I agree, I agree with you that sometimes um, it might be an advantage. Uh, and this has to be decided on a case by case basis. I, I, I will not say that this, there is a general uh, statement there. We, we have to decide on a case by case basis, taking into account all the economic circumstances of the case. Sometimes it will be a disadvantage and therefore you will need to protect that first mover or sometimes no, and then you, you let the market uh, act. And how to do it, how to distinguish, has a difficult issue, of course, and, but it's on a case by case basis. And I think we have one minute to, to give the floor to the attendees online. Maybe Silvia, you can ask something or Miguel. Uh, I you may can attend you in the coffee. Yeah, yeah, we will continue <laughs> here presently with <laughs> Uh, yeah. Silvia. Well, yes, thank you. I would like to, to thank uh, Geronimo for this clear exposition of the problem of the big issue because there are difficulties to solve still because the European Commission, as we see, we are proposing guidelines or the application of one, um, 1013 or whatever. So I think that um, the security, the legal security is the point that you that you have remarked the legal security for the companies on these issues. And I was thinking now that we have our national, well, the Catalan Competition Authority, that it is promoting some financial help for those companies that prepare uh, compliance programs in order to know if they are uh, acting correctly with competition issues. So how companies can deal with this on this green deal if the neither the competition authorities know how to act or going by the case by case um, issue or, or, or problem uh, because this is quite difficult then to to achieve a, a, a compliance program when neither the competition authority can know if there is a ground to decide if an agreement can be exempted or contrary or there are some uh, positive uh, um, results for sustainability. So I was wondering just this thing uh, uh, because I was thinking on the harbors that deal with lots of issues regarding competition and so so uh, I don't know which can be your point of view because then it is do you think that it's fair to go case by case by a kind of asking a kind of comfort letter to the competition authority in order to promote this green deal and to know how companies are acting. So this is my question. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Silvia. Um, I, I mean, uh, um, how to increase uh, legal certainty um, and uh, what competition authorities should do. Um, well, I think the guidance helps, of course. The general guidance will help. And if, for instance, I think it helps a lot in, in the standardization uh, agreements uh, because the list of conditions now is very clear and you know, you know that those standardization agreements will be uh, uh, okay with, with Article 101. So I, I think that helps quite a lot. Uh, it's true if there is a significant increase in price or there is a significant reduction in the choice, then Article 101, Paragraph 1 applies, and then you go to 101, Paragraph 3, uh, and you may have more, more doubts. Um, we have, I mean, I think, I think co competition authorities should, should also continue the debate. They, they should cooperate. Uh, um, and I'm sure the ECN will do it. Uh, and the, the, the discussion and the debate will, will, will not uh, stop. 
uh, indeed, I think that there is a certain room for discussion because when when you have when you have general guidelines um, and those guidelines are sufficiently broad or do not decide everything, there is room for different views. Uh, and they will, I mean, national competition authorities will have to decide cases. What will be desirable for sure is that they exchange views about those cases and the solution and their decisions within this ECN. So I think the, 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 decision, the, the, the debate will continue. And at national level, I think we should have something similar. It's not as a structure, but we have some mechanisms and informally we should also do it. So the debate should, should continue. Um, I'm, I'm sure the Dutch authority will be taking some decisions in the next years uh, and trying to push forward some, some, of the, some of the ideas that it is also promoted. Okay. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Time for coffee now. <laughs> we have uh, 15 minutes. Um, and uh, after that, uh, we, we will have Miguel Verdeguer with the team with the subject abuse of dominance, mergers, and climate change. See you later. Hello, everyone. We have now Miguel Verdeguer's speech about abuse of dominance, mergers, and climate change. Miguel, sorry for, for being late. No, no, not at all. <laughs> I, I took advantage to take another coffee. I wish I could be there with you. So, no, no worries at all. Thank you very much no for worries. being with us again. And, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Happy to see you, by the way. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, buongiorno. Uh, before uh, kicking off, I would like to thank the, the European University uh, Institute for, for the invitation. It's been a shame I couldn't be uh, there with you uh, uh, to attend the, the lectures in person, especially taking into account the, the, uh, the inspiring atmosphere that uh, of, of your campus and of course of Florence. Uh, but in any event, I wish that maybe uh, uh, in the future I, I can pay you uh, a visit soon. And I hope you all are having a, a great time and making the most of the, of, the, of the lectures. And without further ado, let's get down to business. So I'm basically picking up the, the, the narrative from the previous uh, lecture. So it's perfect timing now. Uh, to put the spotlight on uh, the competition policy tools that deal with market power and to try to draw like um, a parallelism with what we've just seen for anti-competitive practices in the in the in the previous uh, lectures. So basically we're going to try to set some light on the role that abuse of dominance and merger control can play uh, to do their bit to the challenge posed by by climate change. So uh, quite a few questions arise here in relation to, to this uh, pressing issue. Uh, can we use the, the framework on abuse of dominance to attack unsustainable behaviors by market players? Or if we put it, you know, like in a positive way, uh, can sustainability grounds be, um, be claimed to justify uh, an abusive uh, behavior? Um, kind of the same questions for, for merger control. So what I'd like to say beforehand is that these questions hit really, really hard. They are like a punch on the very core of competition law, uh, regardless of the uh, jurisdiction. In line with one of the questions put forward by, by I, think it, I think it was uh, Lafar, uh, you know, you just take into account that the whole rethinking process of fitting any public policy consideration into competition law uh, eventually makes the welfare standard uh, pursued by competition 
like uh, being called into question. So uh, first, and with regard to, to um, abuse of dominance. So for all those listening who are not day-to-day -day devoted to competition, Article 102 uh, applies to unilateral conduct by dominant undertakings, um, uh, as well as agreements uh, concluded by, by them. So basically, the, the scope of Article 102 is reserved for dominant players, uh, more precisely to deal with their uh, anti-competitive uh, behavior, uh, with their abusive behavior. So if uh, compared to Article 101, uh, in terms of the relation that there is between these provisions and sustainability issues, um, Article 102 of the, of the Treaty on the Functioning of the EU uh, I'm not going to say every time of the treaty and the functioning of the EU, you already know that. So Article 102, uh, sustainability speaking, has been uh, less explored. But if compared to merger control, at least in my opinion, there is way uh, more literature. And there seems to be like more consensus on the role that uh, abuse of dominance uh, may play on, on sustainability than that of merger control. So uh, at any rate, and before going into uh, more like technicalities, uh, we must bear in mind that being in a dominant position is not in itself illegal. A dominant market player is entitled to compete uh, like any other company. But we must also remember that a dominant company has like this special responsibility to ensure that uh, its conduct does not distort uh, competition. So here is uh, the, the thing uh, since dominant market players have that special responsibility of not uh, distorting competition. We may also expect special responsibility from them when it comes to taking care of the, uh, of the environment. And I, I guess that you know, the, the, the figures um, speak for, for themselves in this respect. You know, it's been estimated like uh, I read something like that. The biggest multinationals account for, I don't know if it was over 70% or 80% of greenhouse gas emissions uh, worldwide. So if such a, a percentage uh, of pollution is in the hands of just a few, it's safe to say that special attention should be um, paid to the behavior of these firms, just like the DMA focuses on, on the big tech companies, taking the, 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 uh, the discussion to, to the regulatory arena. So uh, the relation between size, market power, dominance, and uh, responsibility for sustainability issues gives room for further discussion in another lecture. But uh, at least I'd just like to tell you uh, the point made by probably what I think is the most prominent uh, stream of thought on this particular nuance of, uh, of the topic. So uh, broadly speaking, uh, this uh, stream of thought claim that, claims that special responsibility should be required of big companies with market power in the first place, you know, as these uh, companies have like the ability to, to behave anti-competitively anti to the detriment, not just of a, uh, of the market, but the environment itself. And in the second place, big companies, so big companies with, with, uh, without market power, just because from a positive point of view, because of their size, they also have the proper, uh, the proper size to make difference for, for the benefit of, 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 the, of the planet, of, of the humankind. So basically the, the sector of the scholarly I was talking about argues that the broader the concept of market power like there's like these greater uh, possibilities of competition law to make uh, big companies um, environmentally aware of sustainability issues and act accordingly and behave accordingly. But once again, I don't want to dig deeper like into this uh, particular uh, area. Remember that competition law prohibits the abusive behavior and not the size of the companies themselves. And as I said, this is specific nuance of the topic where uh, we could be rambling uh, on and on for, for hours. So 
uh, as I said, taking the, the line of argument and the narrative from from uh, from from the previous lecture, uh, if if compared and as as opposed to anti-competitive agreements explained before by uh, Professor uh, Maillo, Article 102 has no exception provision. You know, like there is no Article 102 uh, uh, equivalent to the exception rule provided by the third paragraph of Article 101. However, the dominant undertaking may rely on the guidance on the uh, commission's enforcement of Article 102 to try to justify its, uh, its conduct. You know, so the, the alleged justification of the dominant company can be made either by proving that, that its conduct is objectively necessary, you know, as long as such a conduct is essential and proportional to the, to the justification, okay, objectively necessary, or by showing that the conduct gives rise to uh, substantial efficiencies that outweigh any anti-competitive effects on consumers, even when there is for a closer of competitors. And in order for this to happen on legitimate grounds, the dominant player needs to come forward with evidence. Uh, so in this regard, uh, the guidelines require four cumulative uh, conditions to be met. Uh, firstly, uh, it's required that efficiencies have already been achieved or are likely to be uh, achieved in the foreseeable uh, future. Uh, for example, they may consist of technical uh, improvements in the quality of the, of the goods or a reduction in the, in the cost of production or distribution. So uh, first, uh, that condition. Secondly, uh, the conduct must be essential to obtain such efficiencies. Uh, so there, there should be no, no less harmful um, way, uh, less harmful uh, alternative to such a conduct capable of producing the same efficiencies. Okay. Uh, thirdly, the likely efficiencies must outweigh any likely negative effects on competition and on the consumer. So we underline that on the consumer. And last but not least, the conduct must not eliminate effective competition. So these possible justifications uh, built on soft law make us wonder where do we fit sustainability issues in the analysis of 102, of Article 102. So uh, the strongest arguments in favor of fitting environmental considerations into Article 102 are built on the uh, lack of a definition of the concept of abuse in the EU treaties. As there is no definition of abuse in the EU treaties, it might be argued that where an abuse is needed by a dominant player to attain a sustainability goal, I need to do this to, to achieve this uh, environmentally friendly goal, such an abuse may actually not be an abuse may not amount to such a concept, you know, as long as there are no less harmful ways to attain such a goal. Uh, and of course, this interpretation is not exempt of difficulties, as uh, you might already guess. Uh, if you flip through the through the guidelines uh, on Article 102, it seems that the Commission pursues a net consumer welfare standard. Therefore environmental factors should be somehow um, quantified uh, or there's, there's, they should be quantifiable and transferred to the consumers, which is not uh, easy, which is not always easy. Uh, but at any rate, and regardless of that, of the consumer welfare standard, if we want to take the uh, into account environmental considerations, uh, we can always stick to the objective justification argument I was talking about, you know, and there's an open window for this, you know, since the guidelines uh, actually admit exclusionary conduct when it's objectively necessary for health or safety reasons. Uh, 
health and safety reasons, you know, related to the to the product itself. So by health or safety, I guess we can accept environmental uh, grounds. And um, so I guess that um, I don't know you guys in Florence, but here walking on the street uh, in my hometown is like being warm up in a microwave. The point that I try to make here is that no one should call into question that climate change takes its toll, its toll on health and, and safety. So I feel that environmental considerations may well fit into this box. And uh, alternatively, we can draw like this parallelism between the efficiency, efficiencies argument found in the in the in the guidelines on Article 102 uh, and the exemption route set out in Article 1013. Um, for sure, uh, you know uh, the the exemption route provided by, by Article 1013 comes from uh, from um, from primary law, and uh, we're talking about uh, soft law in the case of abuse of dominance. But we can draw like this. Uh, parallelism and, and try to ascertain if it is uh, a valid way to 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 make uh, efficiency claims based on sustainability uh, legitimate and valid uh, on on cases of, of abuse of dominance. So first, Article One Hundred One Three says that uh, the agreement must contribute to improving the production or distribution of uh, goods or promoting technical or uh, um, technical or economic progress, okay? So Article 102 talks about technically improvements in the quality of goods, okay? So which seems to be narrower in scope. You know, at least I think it's quite clear that here for environmental factors to be taken into account, they should be uh, economically measured or quantified. Second, Article 113 uh, states that the agreement must allow consumers a fair share of the resulting benefit, uh, provided that it is to the consumer's advantage. And Article 102, by contrast, uh, somehow uh, remains uh, silent on, 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 on that, on this. So it may, this silence may be due to the fact that the Commission wants to stay clear of a consumer welfare standard, which seems very unlikely if we go through the wording of the guidelines. Third, Article 1013 states that the agreement must not impose on the undertakings concerned restrictions which are not indispensable to the attainment of the uh, objectives. And guidelines in Article 102 also suggest the application of a proportionality test. So on this point, we have uh, uh, a match. And fourth, Article 1013 uh, of the Treaty on the Functioning of the U.S. states that an agreement must not afford the possibility of eliminating competition. However, guidelines on Article 102 do not refer to this point at all. You know, the, the opposite, I would say. Uh, um, according to the very nature of an exclusionary abuse, there, there's for a closure of competitors. So long story short, May the parallelism with Article 1013 be drawn? Yes, I think it can be drawn, such a parallelism. But is such a parallelism a bit stretched or forced, to put it uh, in a way? Sure. No. Uh, sure, it's a little bit uh, stretched. However, uh, I, for one, consider that we must tip the scales in favor of taking into account environmental factors in applying Article 102, uh, mainly on the grounds that um, such an interpretation must be in compliance with EU primary law that we already talked about in the, in the, in the previous lecture. You know, as the protection of the environment actually lies at the very heart of the EU treaties as a permanent goal of the Union, the Treaty on the European Union in, in its Article uh, 3 uh, argues that the establishment of the internal market uh, shall work for the sustainable development of Europe uh, based, uh, amongst all the reasons, on the protection of the environment. So we could use that article, uh, that provision, that protection of the environment stemming from, from primary law, which I think it's uh, very, uh, very useful, 
Also, Article 7 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the, of the EU enshrines the Union's duty to ensure consistency uh, between its policies and, and, and activities, you know, and such a consistency is obviously expected to be attained between competition law and, and, other, uh, and other policies. So we have Article 3, Article 7, and on the top of that, we have Article 11 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the EU that sets out that uh, environmental protection requirements must be integrated into the definition and implementation of the policies of the European Union. You know, so we have, uh, and I think that it makes like a special reference to uh, the sustainable development. So therefore, uh, according to the wording of, of these provisions, uh, every single policy must be placed at the service of the environment to ensure its sustainability. And, you know, so, so must be competition policy. And to me, this argument on the constitutional uh, principles of EU law is equally applicable to, to merger control. You know? uh, so, and I'm jumping straight away uh, in merger control. As I think it will take me a little bit longer uh, to, uh, to elaborate on, on that particular uh, area. So when it comes to, to merger control, the, there's like this the long-standing contention between competition and non-competition factors in merchant control analysis has grown like a, a, a lot throughout the past years. You know, we must remember that merchant control is at, at least in principle aimed at preventing anti-competitive effects arising from structural changes. And as I said, in principle, because even though keeping a competitive market uh, is the most common uh, thread for the creation of rules on merger control, the underlying reason of the design of a merger control uh, regime can shift uh, in a significant manner from country to, to country. So this basically means that uh, the degree of, of uh, significance of, of relevance that environmental factors half in merger control is up to the lawmaker of uh, its jurisdiction. So what, it, what is clear and, and, and common uh, to the essence of merger control, regardless of the jurisdiction, is the, the, theories, of, the theories of harm that involve uh, environmental uh, considerations. You know, the theories of harm uh, that were, you know, I think there's quite uh, a big uh, consensus uh, on them. Uh, for instance, uh, we can affirm that a merger between competitors devoted to manufacturing sustainable products may eliminate the natural competitive constraints posed by uh, between the companies, which is eventually likely to give rise to higher prices and or uh, reduced uh, innovation. It may also be the case where, uh, as a result of a merger, parties to a uh, concentration gain sufficient buyer power so as, to uh, so as to discourage activity in the upstream market. So there is uh, this case, um, the case uh, Aurubis uh, Metallo, which illustrates this theory at, at its best. In the case, the European Commission uh, cleared the, the, the acquisition of, of Metallo, which was a, a refiner of copper, of copper scrap, by the other company, by Arubis, which is the largest copper producer in Europe. And since both operated in, in, uh, in purchasing, uh, in the purchasing of copper scrap in the European Economic Area, the, the Commission was afraid of the new merged company gaining sufficient buyer power so as to um, enable the new company to lower the price at which it purchased copper scrap. You know, um, so, okay, we mentioned that. Uh, another theory of harm is based on those incumbents in the market whose activities truly pollute uh, the, the environment, you know, who may feel like um, compelled to chase down green startups and or green mavericks to remove pressure from the market. So this type of mergers kills innovation. You know, that's why we refer to them as 
uh, sustainability uh, killer acquisitions or green killer acquisitions. And, you know, and to top it off, these mergers make sustainable companies less attractive to put money into to for, for investors. And also companies themselves may feel the same way and put off their uh, the transition to of, of their activities to a more sustainable uh, business uh, model. And outside the theories of harm and taking into, into consideration environmental factors within, uh, within the traditional competition-based analysis of mergers, if we think out of, 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 of that traditional uh, way of, of analyzing mergers, and this is not a theory of harm, I, I again, uh, I, I, I would like to underline that again. If we wanted to take the debate to the extreme, because there are, there's actually a, a sector of the scholarly that 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 argues that this this uh, this particular uh, argument, we could actually ask ourselves: It will be possible to uh, uh, prohibit or clear a merger where environmental factors advised against the economic analysis? Will it be, will that be possible so that will be taking that to the very extreme but as i said there's a real uh, academic sector arguing in favor of that so interpretation of the current wording of the eu merger regulation can but not exempt of difficulties be stretched in a favorable manner to to deal with uh to take into consideration environmental factors but for sure, not in isolation, not in isolation, always accompanying, accompanying uh, competition-based uh, factors. So it must be said, though, that such an extensive interpretation raises a number of doubts and creates a, a debate that even calls into question the welfare standard of merger control, as I said at the beginning. You know, so at the very least, uh, we can for sure affirm that nowadays the legal framework as it stands does not sufficiently provide the market with the desirable certainty to operate in it. And this is in line with uh, uh, what Professor Mayer was saying uh, as, as regards uh, anti-competitive agreements. You know, legal certainty once again is at the, at the very uh, core of the, of the debate. Uh, we can also claim that environment-related contributing factors have little scope for application under the current EU merger control regime. We can also argue that, that point of view, even that it has less room for consideration than the rest of the competition law uh, pillars. And you can see uh, that in if, if you read papers from uh, from the scholarly. Uh, you can you can see that there's uh, more way more literature on on 1013 and there seems to be a line of uh, a path towards a consensus also thank you to to, to national competition authorities such as the the, the Greek or the Dutch uh, competition uh, authorities and when it comes to to merger control it must be said though that uh, some progress has been made in, in this respect if taken into consideration that the original uh, EU merger control regulation provided for a test that was conditional upon the creation or strengthening of, uh, of a dominant uh, position, which is the dominance test. So nowadays, uh, somewhat easier it is to take into account environmental factors uh, in the test of whether a concentration will significantly uh, impede effective competition I think it's more flexible uh, and for sure uh, it is easier to fit environmental considerations into uh, the CEC test. So one of the questions that, uh, that arises here at this point is whether or not environmentally friendly uh, considerations can be taken into account when applying such a, te such a test, the, when applying the, the CEC test. So Article 2 of the EU merger regulation states that uh, its rules should be applied with a view to establishing whether or not they are compatible with the common market. Okay, Nowadays, 
the internal market. So you know, uh, so uh, at this point, we can ask ourselves where can we draw that parallelism that we're talking about with deficiencies set out in Article 1013. Uh, so, well, in the, the first paragraph of Article 2 of the EU marital regulation lists a number of factors that the Commission should take into account when making its appraisal of a, of a concentration. And of course, there are uh, some similarities to the famous Article 1013. Uh, the first two conditions set out in Article 1013, uh, promotion of uh, technical and economic progress and a fair share of the resulting uh, benefits to consumers match the first part of the EU merit regulation formula. Uh, the condition on proportionality of Article 101 and the prohibition on non-elimination of competition could even be uh, encapsulated within the formula adopted by the EU merger regulation, um, which seems to be even uh, more stringent in, in this respect. Um, as it talks about that there should be no obstacle to, to competition. So broadly speaking through this uh, comparison, it may seem and may seem easy to bring the flexibility found in article 1013 to accept environmentally friendly considerations into Article One, uh, sorry, into Article Two of the EU Merger Regulation, and actually, as you can uh, as you can see, I will say that that the resemblance of Article One One Three and Article Two is, um, I would say, is uncanny. Is quite uh, they they, they there, there's a high level of, of resemblance between them. So from this uh, parallelism that we're talking about. It can be argued that environmentally friendly considerations can be taken into account in the shape of efficiencies, just as it is the case for Article 1, uh, 1013, or even the case uh, of Article 102 that we uh, talked about uh, earlier. However, uh, the reality shows that to date there are no cases where, where the Commission has cleared an otherwise anti-competitive merger exclusively on grounds of environmental efficiencies okay exclusively on grounds of, of environmental efficiencies so fact this fact answers the question raised in the beginning uh put out by a sector of the scholarly the, the one that uh related to uh environmental factors could uh, prohibit or clear uh, a merger against the economic analysis advised by, 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 by the enforcer. So, you know, the reality is that uh, nowadays this is not, does not seem that, that possible. So uh, on the other hand, uh, when, when making uh, its appraisal of a concentration, the commission takes into account a few con conditions for conducting the, the efficiencies analysis, you know, quite, uh, well known, you know, in order for the commission to, to perform its assessment, there are three cumulative conditions that have to be met if, if, if efficiencies are to be taken into uh, consideration. Uh, the first one, efficiencies must uh, benefit consumers. Uh, so in order for consumers not to be worse off as a result of a merger, and I'm going to read literally what the regulation says, uh, efficiencies should be substantial and timely and should, in principle, benefit consumers in those relevant markets where it is otherwise likely that competition concerns will occur. Read again, efficiencies should be substantial and timely and should, in principle, benefit consumers. Okay. Uh, so a few interpretations may arise from such a uh, phrase. There's a doctrinal debate again. Uh, eventually, I think that everything boils down to, to, to a semantic difference. Uh, after a first reading, it stands up that, you know, the, like the economic connotation of what is meant by, by consumers for the purposes of, of, the, of merger control exemption route. You know, so from this stance, it does not seem that the guidelines 
are intended to include public policy considerations into the um, efficiencies analysis, you know, unless that these efficiencies come hand in hand with quantitative economic evidence, which might be uh, quantifiable, you know, uh, in terms of pro competitive effects. So from this point of view, sustainability physicists could be considered not in isolation, but always accompanying, accompanying in market efficiencies, in market efficiencies. With, uh, if direct customers benefit from the efficiencies, uh, it should not be an obstacle that environmental efficiencies reach a broader spectrum of individuals. After a second and more thought of reading, according to another doctrinal sector, we can also understand that direct consumers are the most common group of individuals that capitalize on efficiencies, that may capitalize on efficiencies. But they are an alternative, you know, but they are alternative. So how come is that? Since the lawmaker used the phrase in principle, you know, efficiencies should be substantial and timely and should in principle benefit consumers, it could be accepted that there is an alternative group to direct uh, consumers. So these will be out of market beneficiaries, we could say. A broader concept which better embraces environmental related efficiencies. However, I think that normally uh, if out of market individuals are uh, benefiting from the merger, it's obvious that direct consumers are benefiting uh, too at the same time, you know, if there are uh, other people outside the, the relevant market, outside the, the internal market, benefiting from, from a given concentration, for sure, I will have this in principle, I guess, the consumers themselves from the merged firm are benefiting uh, from the merger too. So uh, from these two alternative interpretations, uh, it should be stressed like there is like a lack of clarity. Uh, you know, if, uh, if you really want to um, outline or ascertain the breadth of the scope, you know, the, the, the fact that the conclusion boils down to a semantic difference suggests an imperative need for clarification of the guidelines. If you read papers on the issue, it's like everything boils down to teeny tiny details of the, of the guidelines, uh, phrases like this in principle, uh, and, and, and similar stuff. So, moreover, if we take if we take the, the same phrase I was talking about, uh, efficiency should be substantial and timely. Okay, so if attention is to be paid to the adjective timely, okay, then it is more difficult to accept environment-related considerations in the analysis. Why? Because the Commission expects efficiencies to emerge better sooner than later. So it stands to reason that it is really tricky for the commission to ascertain the time at which environmental considerations will materialize in the future. Or at least if you don't wanna say it's really tricky, we can say that it's way more burdensome on the commission to, to, to be certain about that. So uh, we said that efficiencies must benefit consumers. Now, secondly, efficiencies must be merger specific. So this means that efficiencies must be a direct consequence of the, of the merger and cannot be achieved by uh, less anti-competitive means or there are no uh, other less anti-competitive ways uh, to, to achieve those, those efficiencies. So apparently, it is not that easy to show that environmental benefits are uh, direct consequence of, of the merger. You know, the, the implementation of uh, quantitative evaluation techniques to evaluate environmental efficiencies should go with greater flexibility on the part of the enforcer. You know, if you are going to accept that those efficiencies, those environmental efficiencies are attributable to, to the merger. So it requires like greater flexibility on the part of the commission in this case. So very uh, much specific and in, the, and in the third place, efficiencies have to be 
verifiable. So in the sense that the commission can be certain that the efficiency is likely to materialize. So this goes in line with uh, the timeliness feature that I mentioned earlier, and also with the merger specificity criterion. So claims relating to uh, environment efficiencies may seem uh, vague, I would say, or distant in time. So these efficiencies are difficult to verify by reasonable, by reasonable means as the, as the guidelines, no, as, as the regulation uh, states. Very, very more difficult to verify. So traditionally, as you know, price effects have been, uh, have received uh, greater attention from the enforcer in comparison to longer term effects such as innovation. So here we have the debate again of uh, dynamic efficiencies and the innovation uh, related to public policy considerations in general and climate change in particular. But, uh, and in line with that, in addition to the lower prices or cost savings that, the, uh, that, that, that you can read in the law, uh, they also recognize that consumers may also benefit from efficient, efficiency gains that arise from R&D, from research and development and innovation, okay? So I, for one, think uh, this, actually this phrase uh, is in the, in the horizontal merger guidelines, not in the regulation, okay? Uh, so I, for one, think that environmental efficiencies could be in principle fit in this category, you know, the, the research and development and innovation. So the, the challenge that the guidelines post here uh, lies again in ascertaining when such efficiencies, efficiencies are likely to be materialized. Again, uh, a question of, uh, of certainty. And again, a class between the traditional economic analysis and uh, a more biased, uh, point of view of analyzing or assessing or evaluating uh, uh, a merger. So the best strategy that I would suggest to the parties to a concentration uh, to make their point on the verifiability, uh, on the verifiability, on the timeliness feature, on the merger specificity uh, of the expected efficiencies will be uh, showing an authentic complementarity between the their respective assets you know so parties to a concentration can explain why through the combination of their assets uh, the expected efficiencies can be reached at some point in the future and and likewise the, in the same manner they should also spell out the reasons on account of which uh, the merger is the best way to accomplish such efficiencies in such a way that there are uh, no other less harmful ways, non concentrative means to achieve those uh, efficiencies. And on the top of all this, I also want to say that the consideration of uh, environmental factors may find its way in merger control through, through, but outside the EU merger regulation by applying its Article 21.4. Okay, Article 21.4. So this provision, uh, I'm not going to read the full provision, but uh, it reads something like, uh, member states may take appropriate measures to protect legitimate interests other than those taken into consideration by this regulation and compatible with the general principles and other provisions of community law. You know, well, and at the beginning, there's something uh, that says with full respect to the one stop shop principle, blah, blah. So, uh, yeah, I guess that this provision is uh, very interesting, you know, uh, for the purposes of, the, of uh, taking into consideration uh, environmental uh, factors. You know, sustainability issues may well fall within the legitimate interest category uh, that I just uh, read. So, the um, subsequently, uh, the supranational norm, the supranational law may be 
interpreted as allowing member states to close the gap on sustainability if they deem appropriate to do so in their respective regimes. Okay, uh, because the, the, the text is saying member states may take appropriate measures. So, uh, an article, uh, Article uh, 21 4 goes on to say, uh, on the grounds of public security, plurality of the media, and prudential rules shall be regarded as legitimate interests within the meaning of the first paragraph. So climate change by its very nature is the, the threat to public security par excellence. You know, uh, I think that uh, that fact suggests that sustainability issues fit in the merger control analysis of those member states wishing to take them into consideration, you know, by relying on, on this particular uh, provision. Uh, for instance, environmental protection benefits are expressly taken into account uh, under, uh, Spanish, uh, under the Spanish Competition uh, Act. You know, the Spanish Competition Act say, says something like the Council of Ministers or the, the, the Cabinet may assess economic concentrations in light of criteria of uh, general interest, blah, blah, blah. Uh, amongst them, you can find environment protection, something like that, okay? So here in Spain, uh, uh, on occasion of uh, the case, uh, Repsol, uh, Repsol uh, Viesgo, or Viesgo um, allowed the acquisition of uh, the, uh, hydraulic, I think it was an hydraulic energy generation um, business uh, of Biesgo by Repsol, which is a Spanish multinational uh, energy uh, company and petrochemical. So the operation in question, that operation Repsol Biesgo paved the way for Repsol to initiate its way in the green power uh, market. You know, uh, this case sets an example for other companies uh, in Spain intending to follow a transition to a low carbon emission business model. Uh, its case, of course, subject to the particularities of, uh, you know, of, of the, the, it's required a case, uh, an, a case by case analysis for sure. But, but I think it's uh, a very good example uh, of, uh, of environmentally features taking into account in merger analysis. And outside the European Union, uh, there are other jurisdictions that have incorporated sustainability uh, in their respective assessments. We have the, the CMA, the Competition Markets Authority in the UK, which recently uh, uh, stepped up in this regard and included uh, environmental consideration into their, uh, their, their assessment. You know, so so um, basically, and all in all and on the whole, I will confirm that the EU merge regulation can be stretched to assess, and I, I prefer to use the word stretch, to assess environmental considerations, namely on two grounds. First, and the, the most important, because it is imperative that every single tool at our disposal needs to fight climate change. And I think that competition law uh, is one that might do uh, it's bit. It's uh, not going to be the, the 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 main tool, but for sure it can do something about it. Um, and second, the interpretation of the wording of the merger regulation can be bent and modeled and stretched in favor of considering sustainability issues, especially and most importantly, because of the whole debate on constitutional principles. You know. Because if it's true that our constitutional principles allow us to do so, to adopt, to protect environmental considerations, to take them into account in other activities, to take them into account in other policies, in the design, in the implementation. So I think that why not uh, can we uh, use competition, our merger control regime in this, in this way. So this conclusion uh, on the top of that is bolstered by Recital 23, I don't know, it's 23 or 29 to the merger regulation, which places the regulation at the service of primary law. Uh, however, however, notwithstanding the fact that I said that 
I think that it can be used to to favorably to to argue in favor of um, of environmental factors. The lack of clarity uh, must be underlined, you know. And since since uh, I'm a strong advocate for uh, for legal uh, certainty, I truly feel that either the regulation itself or the guidelines should be reviewed by the legislator and clarify uh, all this, okay? Uh, but I will also agree with what Professor Maio said in the previous lecture, for sure, it will be very helpful if the uh, Commission and uh, the European Court of Justice and uh, their decisions and their judgments evolved in a manner that, in a consistent manner, uh, taking into account environmental factors. And I think that if that happened, that will uh, also provide the, the legal certainty that I'm talking about. But, but I would for sure be a, a stronger advocate for changing, uh, amending slightly the, the, the guidelines uh, or, or the regulation itself. And if this doesn't take place, then competition rules will continue to have a chilling effect on on, on competition on, on those companies wishing to 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 innovate by developing sustainable uh, products. You know, um, even though uh, in the in the debate generated in the in the, in the previous lecture, uh, we saw a, a specific case where. Uh, the first mover uh, actually uh, used the, the environmental considerations in its favor. But, but I think that that's an exception. And usually, more often, uh, if there is no clarification, uh, the, the, the merger regulation as it stands today has a chilling effect on competition. And for sure, I think it restrains and holds back companies from from uh, engaging uh, in sustainable mergers or, 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 or the enforcer from, from prohibiting unsustainable mergers, you know. Um, so anyway, I, I, I am supportive of that. And kind of the same for abuse of dominance. Again. Okay, so taking again the, the, the line of argument, the narrative at the, uh, at the beginning of the lecture. Uh, and, this, and in this case, I would not leave out exploitative abuses out of the guidelines, you know, since they may also favor unsustainable outcomes. You know, I think that overlooking exploitative abuses is um, triggering or prompting a large loophole for the purposes of taking environmental considerations into account. Uh, and last remark, as mentioned, uh, by Professor May, your regulation might be very useful to supplement comp competition law, just as the DMA uh, supplements competition law in digital markets. Specific regulation on environment-related markets may also uh, do the, the trick in this sense. And with that, I, um, you know, if there are any questions, I will be happy to try to, to answer. Thank you very much, Miguel, for your effort to clarify on this uh, complex panorama, uh, the, the specific questions on, on the interpretation on, on abuse of domination and merger regulation, the interpretation of the guidelines. It was really, really interesting. I don't know if Professor Maillo would like some, some, some give some remarks. Yes, mm. yes I, 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 I have some, some questions or comments, but maybe maybe we can uh, open as well before the, uh, in case there's uh, any other question. Uh, I think uh, Teresa wanted to, to intervene. Okay, so um, thank you very much, Miguel, for this presentation. It was very interesting. Okay, now you can see me. Hello, I am, my name is Teresa Ariani and I am a PhD researcher here at the UI and I'm researching sustainability and competition law. So this presentation for me was particularly interesting and on topic. And so it was, I really appreciated it because we talk, I think we don't like, we talk about article 102 and mergers a lot less than we talk about um, agreements when we talk about sustainability and, and competition. So this 
presentation was particularly appreciated, um, I must say. But, and I have, I have a couple questions, like maybe it's questions, it's remarks. So first concerning the, like um, the objective ju justification and efficiency justification for abuses of dominant position that might be uh, justified for sustainability reasons. So already with, um, with agreements, we've seen that um, the industry has some difficulty coming up with concrete examples of instances where competition was a hurdle, an obstacle in like in putting forward sustainability initiatives. And I wonder, have we had any examples, any concrete examples in Article 102 TFU yet? Because I think it's important to, um, to remember that like competition authorities, especially national competition authorities, they are like, their resources are limited and some of them are already struggling with like the mm, the DM, the enforcement of not the DMA but like the competition in the digital sector because mm, because competition enforcement has become so much more complex and so adding this complexity um, is it really necessary at this point you think so this is my first question or is it or is it more like a willingness of competition law to contribute but is there a need from the part of the industry that meets this willingness of competition law to contribute so this is my first question and then my second question i must say i'm a bit i you will say i'm a bit skeptical of opening up article 102 but my second question is so if we think of the polluter principle um in environmental law in article 191 tfu we have so the polluter must pay and i'm i'm wondering allowing um firms as you were saying multinational firms they make up a big chunk of global emissions allowing them to um in a, to engage in what would be abuses of dominant position in order to foster the transition to a sustainable economy wouldn't that mean um, actually shifting the burden of the transition from the polluters, the com these companies, to, for example, smaller, their, the, um, their, um, their suppliers, who sometimes maybe might be smaller or all, even to the consumers. And how can we tackle this problem? Like first, if for you, it is a problem, and if it is, how can we tackle this and make sure that it is, a, that the enforcement is balanced? So these are my questions about abuse of dominant position. And my third, que my other questions are more about more, more general, I guess, and they are about what is often called um, preventative competition law or like offensive use of competition law. So using competition law against unsustainable practices rather than to uh, foster sustainable practices. And of course, this is a very, very controversial question because it really, really challenges the roots of competition law. But Mike, what I wonder is having, like, if we allow a different standard for competition law instead of consumer welfare, something that is more similar to citizen welfare for efficient, like for the assessment of efficiencies and mergers and benefits under Article 1013 uh, for agreements, wouldn't it be more internally coherent to use the same type of um, the same type of standard across all competition law, because otherwise, otherwise we found ourselves we find ourselves in a situation where, when we assess a prima facie abuse or the, whether an, whether a, mer a merger prima facie is is restrictive, we use a one type of standard, which is a strict normal consumer welfare standard. But then we switch to a different standard when we as, when we um, when we assess efficiency, and I wonder given how much effort uh, we've put like competition enforcers and lawyers have put in the past decades to streamline enforcement to streamline the text the the tests also across 102 across 101 across mergers for example the fact the effort of coming up with a straight with a very very um with a very precise definition of the Objective, objective justification, given this effort of streamlining and of providing coherence to competition law, wouldn't this, this be a problem? So this is my third question. And my fourth question is very simple. Do you think that the forthcoming preliminary ruling of the ECJ in the Bundeskartellamt Facebook case 
might have an impact on sustainability considerations in competition law. Thank you very much for the presentation and sorry for taking so much time. No, not at all. Thank you for your uh, questions. I can tell that you are actually into uh, into the into this uh, specific uh, topic. Uh, as regards the first question, I think that uh, you also said that if there were any examples of um, abuses, also that there were uh, environmental implications are uh, you know at, at the core of the of the analysis, and and if there is a willingness. Uh, enough willingness uh, in, in, on the part of competition law to, to enter, to amend uh, guidelines on Article 102, and if it's worth the, 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 the effort you know, to, to, to make such an amendment. Uh, so when it comes to, to examples of, of abuse, I think there are, there are quite a few, like charting a higher price in order to cover uh, environmental costs, or reinvest in environmental protection. This is to, to counter allegations of excessive pricing, for instance, uh, or char uh, charging different customers different prices uh, according to the use uh, that the environmentally friendly use that of the product is given by, by the buyer, you know, whether products are recycled or not, or maybe uh, the energy efficiency of the downstream production process, you know, and that is useful to counter allegations of discriminatory pricing. Uh, another one, making the purchase of one product from the dominant company conditional on the purchase of, a, of another environmentally friendly uh, product, uh, you know, the, which will counter an allegation of, uh, of tying or offering exceptionally very, very low prices to generate a trial of a new environmentally friendly product to counter an allegation of predatory pricing. So I think that uh, we have like, a there may be like a list of, of uh, unilateral conduct that will suggest that competition laws will enter uh, to, to, uh, to take environmental considerations into, into this particular analysis and in the objective uh, uh, justification uh, uh, test. So I would say that that eventually um, I don't, probably the commission will, will open a, a, you know like a, an inquiry, an open inquiry to, 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 to see uh, the, the public opinion on, 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 on this. But for sure, I think it's, 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 there's a willingness and it's worth the, the, the effort, you know, especially taking into account the, the urgency of the, of, the, of, the, of the climate crisis, you know. They are very tricky questions, I, I gotta say. Uh, so as regards the, uh, I think we, well, I, I don't know if, if you were also asking for, for case law on a specific case law and not just unilateral examples of unilateral conduct, but we have just a few examples of, um, uh, of, of unilateral conduct with environmental considerations in it. So Tetra, I, I'm sure that you already read the, these cases, Tetra Pak, you know, where the objective justification was, although unsuccessfully argued that, cart that cartons were safe for consumers. Uh, Hilti, in Hilti, where it was also unsuccessfully argued that nail guns were used safely. So it's not exactly environment, but there are like public policy considerations. And there is another case uh, whose name I don't remember. But uh, anyway, so there are, there, are, there are cases where these factors are at stake and for sure, I think that competition law uh, should uh, enter to, 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 to have a say on, on these issues, especially on the list that I, said at the beginning, you know, on, the, on those unilateral conducts. Uh, as regards the, all the, 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 big, the big firms and, you know, uh, the consumer welfare led competition policy uh, operates towards the attainment of maximum output. I think that uh, Lathar used this uh, phrase uh, in the previous uh, 
uh, Q&A and questions. Uh, so market power, either in isolation or as a result of a, of a concentration between two mergers, lays the groundwork for attaining economies of scale, you know, like lower cost, uh, lower, uh, lower per unit cost. And in some cases, this leads to an increase in output. Uh, so an, over, an overproduction, which is considered one of the root causes of for climate change, uh, may well arise here. So this policy of maximizing output all the time uh, runs counter to the idea of reducing the resource uh, uh, and the waste, um, the resource use and the waste and greenhouse gas emissions. Therefore, as we need a massive reduction in, in, the, in, the, in resource use, competition law may reconsider the, the connection between maximizing output and welfare. And so big firms, I think that here have uh, like, like that special responsibility that I was talking at the beginning. There's this Harvard professor, uh, Mark, uh, Mark Rowe, uh, I think uh, his name is, uh, which says that firms in competitive industries cannot deviate from profit maximization. You know, because if if uh, uh, they, they need they need to 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 be there if you if they want to to make money and, and grow, you know. Except uh, in the narrow circumstances in which doing good, in which doing something environmentally sustainable may facilitate financial performance. Uh, but also, he argues that the larger the market power, the companies the with market power, the greater chances for the company to to allocate the funding to sustainability uh, purposes. And I think that you uh, said something about, I, I don't know if you mentioned that the burden of proof uh, was, what was it the burden? Oh, of no, proof? it was more like the burden, the, in a sense, the financial burden of the transition to a more sustainable economy, which like, on which do, do we decide to lay, to, to put the burden? Like, no, it was not about like burden of proof in like in procedural matters. It was more about decision. Like these are in the end distributive decisions about on whom to place the the burden of the transition on the sustainable transition in the first uh, in the first place. I would say. I have to say that I I, I don't have my mind made up on that. Uh, I uh, I don't know. I have got to say that I I didn't make up my mind on that particular um, issue, so I'm, I'm really regret uh, not being able to 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 to, to clarify that particular uh, point. Uh, yeah, and so as for the third question. Um, I really regret that, that I couldn't uh, answer to you to that question. Uh, and about the third one, the, the coherence of the consumer welfare, uh, I will agree with you fully on that uh, particular uh, uh, point of view. Uh, for sure, there should be like more coherence between uh, the consumer welfare to be pursued in, uh, regardless of the competition pillar that we're talking about. Uh, at the end, there's... Uh, a, a heated debate on, on this consumer welfare standard, regardless of the topic that comes up. You know, we might be talking about the environment, we might be talking about the DMA or about uh, whatever that always comes up the, the consumer welfare standard. And it's not at all clear because if you look at, uh, in the case of EU merger regulation, if you look uh, the the wording of the, of the law itself, it looks like perfectly uh, uh, that it fits in um, a consumer welfare standard. But if you go uh, to the primary law, which actually uh, should be at, at, at the top, uh, hierarchically speaking, uh, it seems that there are there's some more social welfare uh, standard, a broader, a broader concept. And if you move to another competition pillars, then you see some inconsistency in the, inconsistencies in this sense. So I think that at the end, this is like... Uh, this is a this is a, a, a an issue to 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 work out, you know, not individually but uh, collectively, you know, and 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 I will even go further on on this, not just in European Union competition law. I will I will even say that topics like these uh, where where there are 
environmental factors or digital markets, especially with, with all the challenges that, that the, uh, digitalization and, and the environment are posing to the society as a whole. I think that the, also there should be like a broader consensus on what we are pursuing at the global level. So the, the OECD and the ICN uh, maybe could set some light on, on that, but for sure we need, we need more coherence in uh, topics as important as, uh, as uh, these ones. And, and as for the last question, uh, could you repeat again the, the last question, please? It was if like the, um, there's this um, forthcoming, well, in the hopefully next year's decision, by like ruling by the uh, European Court of Justice in the case of the Bundeskartellamt against the Facebook, uh, against Facebook that actually turned uh, like treated a data protection violate a data protection regulation violation as a competition law offense so it qualified like it seems to allow the consideration of um of issues that are outside the strict competition mm, competition sphere as mm, as abuses of like abuses of dominant position and as relevant for characterizing in general violations of competition law. And the ECJ is said to pronounce to, um, to pronounce itself on this. And I wonder if you, you think that this will have an impact on this debate as well, even if it's in the digital sphere, but if there will be spillovers in, in here in the sustainability sphere as well. Yeah, yeah uh, I think that for sure it will have spillover effects into uh, the uh, into these particular uh, uh topic you know because at the end we're talking about public policy considerations and the fact of opening the box of competition law in order to uh, cover other aspects that are not uh based on economic uh, facts and figures so the the, the classic uh, approach that we all seem to like uh so much so at the end i think that we're talking about the same we should ask ourselves what is sustainability because maybe in the world of sustainability uh, what well, maybe not for sure uh, it's not just climate change there are other topics related to climate change uh, from climate change we go to environment from environment we can touch uh, other topics and as well as uh, the the waiters the, sorry the wages of of of, of workers or uh, the privacy data uh, uh, data privacy uh, for sure, they, they are uh, they are in the that's a topic with with relevance for this. So we can for sure uh, take conclusions from one from 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 one uh, decision from one uh, judgment to uh, to uh, to other uh, areas such as uh, environmental uh, issue. I read a paper on on that case, and and I don't know if it was like a preparatory work something. Uh, but I think that I, I read it from the, the Bundeskartell website uh, that mentioned something uh, something related to that. I, I don't know. I don't. I don't think that it said something about environmental factors, but for sure public policy considerations. And within that box, we can fit data privacy and all that. And so this debate it's going to linger on uh, a lot. And we all are into competition law because we like this we are fond of of this uh, branch of of law and we i don't know i'm, I'm a supporter of the free market economy i uh, as you know as a, as a child i already like to read uh, adam smith david ricardo and and all that and and it seems to me that that people that we share this passion of competition law uh, uh, we are somehow reluctant to, to acknowledge that uh, there are certain cases where uh, you know competition law cannot uh, deal with some uh, some with some issues by by itself and you know and I think that even Adam Smith didn't say anything opposite to that if we go to the beginning of of economic theories uh, it actually acknowledged that market power can actually go out of control and it would be allowed market uh, intervention by the state. So if the state intervenes for one thing uh, on economic grounds, maybe it may intervene for environmental factors, data privacy. So at the end, this debate is there and for sure uh, the, the, uh, 
the decision of that case will for sure uh, will have spillover effects uh, and at the very least uh, if you are an enthusiast of competition law i will write a paper on that i will uh, make a comparison sorry and sorry if, sorry if i don't if i didn't reply to the second question i try to do to do my best and nice to meet you Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to, to, to both of you. Thank you very much for the, uh, for the, uh, I, I don't know what is happening with the camera. Hello. Switch it off. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Uh, I, I was just uh, saying that, uh, uh, thank you very much to, to both of you for this uh, uh, rich debate, uh, for the questions and the, and the answers. Uh, we have run out of time, so uh, it, it is, it is uh, time to, to close the session. Just let me very briefly some final concluding remarks. Uh, the first one will be, do not forget in this debate about sustainability and, uh, and, and competition uh, Article 102, and particularly, particularly merger control. I think uh, I, I think it's important. 101 uh, is uh, very important. But don't forget the others because I think uh, they have uh, something to say. Uh, and uh, just to note something: efficiencies are becoming more and more important in mergers in general. So green efficiencies as well. And uh, uh, we have in mergers quicker decisions. We have a lot of decisions. They are public. And moreover, they are very quick. So I mean, a couple of months or uh, even one month or most complex cases where probably a, a richer debate on efficiencies or an agreed efficiencies may, may come up is, is uh, six months as, uh, as a maximum. So we may have their uh, possibilities for the European Commission to argue and, and, and to debate on, on those uh, green efficiencies and on how to quantify it and, and how to accept them and how to counterbalance them with uh, other restrictive effects. So I will think this uh, is something not to forget. Um, I believe much more on that than on the use of Article 121, uh, Paragraph 4 of the Merger Control Regulation, as you mentioned, Miguel, because uh, at the very end, uh, if the Commission forbids a merger under the Merger Control Regulation, the merger is forbidden, and, and there is no way that you are going to be able to authorize it because of sustainability goals. That can be done under certain national legislations, but not under the merger control regulation. So there, we, we I, I expect less interest in the bottom developments, maybe at national level, we, we can see some of them, but not certainly at, at European level, but yes, in uh, merger analysis. So I think that's uh, that's my, my concluding remark. Thank you very much to all, to all of you. We close the session and uh, uh, we uh, uh, will be back uh, at 2.30 for uh, uh, public uh, restraints uh, of competition and in particular state ed policy. Thank you very much. Bye. Good afternoon to everybody for this afternoon session on the second day of the second week of our summer school on uh, climate governance, EU China. And today we are privileged to have a talk by Marta Escura and uh, Alvaro Anton. And Alvaro is a postdoctoral researcher for the International Fiscal Authority, whose main line of research is energy environmental taxation and regulations on state age. So precisely on the topic that we're going to hear about today. His doctoral thesis, State Aid and Renewable Energy Support Systems, an analysis of the tax benefits under the Energy Taxation Directive to promote biofuels, was awarded uh, the European Academic Tax Thesis Award 
granted by the European Commission and the European Association of Teachers of Tax Law. So congratulations to Alvaro. Uh, he's joined today by Marta Villar, who is with us today um, in presence, which is wonderful. Uh, Marta is full professor of financial and tax law at CEU San Pablo University, where she's taught EU law and tax law since 1993. She's a permanent academic of the Spanish Royal Academy of Jurisprudence and Legislation and has published and lectured extensively on a broad range of tax top topics, including environmental and energy taxation. She's vice president of the supervisory board of the International Fiscal Association, as well as an active member of other scientific and professional association associations. And she leads the research group Taxation, climate change, and digitalization, combining every interesting topic in one in one frame. So I'm delighted to welcome our two speakers who will talk about state aids and climate change, a tax law perspective. And um, Marta and Alvaro, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much, Joan, for your kind uh, introduction and your kind invitation to be here. It's a Pleasure to have the opportunity to see you both in, in person and, and to share this uh, special uh, building and, and, and all the framework of, of so beautiful Florence. This morning we had an interesting uh, debate and presentation on the importance of, uh, of uh, connecting climate change challenges with uh, competition law. And uh, now is the turn to, to go to Article 107, we, we have learned a lot about 101, 102, 103, and now is the turn of a state aid and a climate change. Uh, um, I should start by saying that the state aid control rules have changed a lot to support a climate change targets. And in my presentation, I will address a tax fiscal perspective as an example to show where the main difficulties are. Uh, because this morning we have talked uh, about uh, the importance of the characterization of uh, sustainability, linking sustainability with a different kind of assessment under the specific framework of business cooperation, competition policy in general, or in uh, the specific frame of abuse of dominance and, and merger. And uh, now is the turn uh, to see uh, how is the assessment in the state aid uh, framework and uh, to connect, uh, maybe to prepare the session of tomorrow, which is uh, a specific, uh, specifically linked to, to green taxation. Uh, I would like to start. Uh, I don't know if it's, uh, I should go, no, I should say, got it before changing, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I would like to start by set setting the framework. Uh, the direct origin of the link between state aids and climate change is, to my view, the European Green Deal. In the context of the European Green Deal, uh, there are several strategies and several proposals from the European Commission that consider taxation to support EU's uh, climate change objectives. Uh, to my perspective, they are at least three issues to be uh, highlighted. On the one hand, uh, a recent tax package seeks to boast tax fairness curbing in fair tax competition and increasing tax transparency. It focuses on simplifying tax rules, removing tax obstacles for taxpayers in many sectors in the single market. That it will be the, 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 first, uh, uh, the first step to, to, uh, to highlight. On the other hand, we have the state aid regime and the temporary framework and its updates, which reveal an increased use of national aids. Here, to my view, the challenge is to assure that the aid granted incorporates 
environmental conditions and why to do the correct and the right assessment. Uh, we should address, of course, uh, the importance of the new guidelines from the commissions. And uh, we also have to think on how would be the risk of having North and South different policy divisions because uh, the budget of, of the European uh, uh, Union member states are not, uh, are not the same, of course. Apart from that, uh, I would also like to highlight the importance of the hydrogen strategy for a climate neutral Europe. Um, this uh, strategy aims to adhere as a far larger scale in its production to be or to become uh, fully decarbonized. The priority is to develop gradually renewable hydrogen. And recently uh, we, we can uh, realize that uh, there was a big funding program that was approved by the European Commission uh, precisely in, in this month of, of July with an important uh, financial package to promote this renewable hydrogen. And finally, in any case, now the situation of the pandemic, the COVID-19 and the low cost of renewable energy are accelerating the transformation dreams uh, of the process towards decarbonization. Apart from setting the framework, let me now say uh, some things, some, some remarks uh, of the issue of setting the key issues on, on, on the connection on state aid and climate, uh, climate change. First of all, uh, state aid is about competition policy. Competition policy is its rational, uh, linked with the protection of the internal market to control that state aid do not help its national companies by discriminating others, creating barriers on the internal market. But greening the economy relates to more drivers like circular economy, electrification, or decarbonization. Last week, we have heard from our colleagues, David Robinson and, and, and Jorge, that the importance of the consumer side on the electricity and on energy regulation is uh, very uh, important on the, on the, on the regulation, uh, on the European regulation right now. But, uh, what are the key drivers? Circular economy, electrification, decarbonization, or energy? Everything is connected. Competition policy connect with these key drivers. There are, of course, different values to assess, different rationals, and maybe contradictory interests. Uh, second key issue to take into consideration the side, the other side of the state aid regulation as a limit to national tax powers, as an indirect, indirect harmonization process, tax administration process. This means that the Article 107 of the Treaty of Functioning of the European Union, the Global Block Exemption Regulation, the Energy Taxation Directive, the Commission Guidelines, and all the package under the Modernization Progress should be taken into account also to assess if national tax changes are, accord are in compliance with this complex uh, regulation on state aids. In any case, environmental taxes and environmental tax incentives are of course under the commission controls. There is another key topic to my mind, which is the autonomy and the importance of the autonomy of the European law 
to define key concepts as state aid. We know that there is, that there is an specific guidelines to develop the requirements and the condition of state aids. But of course, there are other important concepts as what is environmental tax? What is a tax or a parafiscal tax? Or what is direct or indirect tax? And what is harmonic tax and non-harmonic tax? And this is really, really very important in order to assess uh, specific cases uh, and has important impact in practice. Um, uh, to me, there is uh, a particular importance of distinguishing what is harmonized and non harmonized taxes in order to apply correctly EU law, because this distinction is considered on the general block exemption regulation and on the guidelines. Uh, in any case, we all know that the role of the Court of Justice of the European Union to set rules principles and guidelines is essential and crucial, but it's not very easy when we connect state aid with tax incentive because of the difficulties on the criteria of selectivity. We have a lot of cases on Spanish uh, different cases, but of course uh, there is Italian one, there, there is a, a lot of, of, uh, of uh, concern in, in all the countries in the European Union. And finally, we have, do not forget that a just transition must be ensured. We connect state aid with climate change, but we need to have legal certainty. This morning we have uh, heard a lot about the need of legal certainty for companies, for individuals, but of course we need justice. And how to put justice uh, in this complex uh, package. Um, now let me, uh, let me just remind that state aid rules apply to tax incentive, not only to uh, subsidies. Tax systems must be in line with the European Union state aid rules. And that means reminding the main important basis, which is paragraph one of article 107. Any aid granted by a member state or through state resources in any forms whatsoever, including fiscal one, which distorts or threatens to distort competition by favoring certain undertakings on the production of certain goods shall, in so far as it affects trade between member states, be incompatible with the internal market. The principal rule is clear, incompatibility as uh, the, these uh, conditions are met. It's important to remark that there are any more specific guidelines for environmental measures. Climb, uh, there, there are specific guidelines, but not for fiscal one. We have specific measures for environmental one. Then the new ones connect climate change and energy, but uh, some years ago, we have a, a specific guidelines on tax measures. Uh, in the, this was in the 90s of the, of the last century, uh, when tax competition was connected with state aid rule regulation, but there are not any more in force. In any case, the so, uh, so named the three-step analysis assessment uh, is applied by the European Court of Justice. First of all, we should take into account what is the tax reference. It is the corporate tax uh, uh, law, the, the corporate tax regulation, or is there any specific uh, basement to consider? The second step is uh, to, to assess if there is a, a derogation of the general system, and the third step is to justify, to know if uh, this discrimination is to justify or not. 
In any case, the compatibility of some aids with an environmental purpose is assured under paragraph three and uh, its uh, developments. Uh, as you all know, there we, we, can, uh, we can have an automatic compatibility under the rules of the general block exemption regulation or an individual, the individual compatibility following the guidelines from the commission. The guidelines, the state aid guidelines for environmental protection and energy uh, were uh, approved on uh, 2014 and uh, their applicability was extended until the end of 2021. The most important aim uh, on that guidelines is uh, to promote the reduction on greenhouse gas emission and to attain renewable energy targets in line with the directive on uh, renewable energy and all the energy uh, regulatory framework, European one. And uh, finally, to promote energy efficiency policy policies in line also with the directive. When the environmental taxes are harmonized under the framework of the energy taxation directive from 2003, the commission can apply a simplified approach for tax reduction respecting the union minimum tax level to assess the necessity of this tax reduction or exemption and to assess the proportionality of the aid. But for the cases that we have national reduction when uh, there is not a harmonized uh, framework, the assessment is not so simple. It's very difficult to assure and to demonstrate the necessity and the proportionality of the aid. What about the new guidelines? Uh, we are waiting a lot on new guidelines, and I, will, uh, I, I would like to focus on the importance of the title, because there is, there is no more connection with environmental purposes, but for climate, energy, and environment in the end. Climate means to take into consideration sustainability goals, to connect international framework, Paris Agreement, United Nations framework with European Union regulation. And this is important because we, uh, we can uh, mention that in this specific framework on the state aid regulation, but it is the same with energy and other uh, renewable um, po politics in uh, renewable energy politics in the European Union. In any case, uh, there is the need to consider under the new guidelines that new technologies and novel support types, as well as recent environmental and energy legislation, is considered on the new guidelines, as well as strategic priorities. This morning, Professor Maillo has uh, focused on, on the idea of uh, that the Commission should have or should not have priorities in its uh, application, in the application of the competition policy. And now the new guidelines uh, has decided to, to take these priorities into consideration. I think this is important. The strategic priorities are, of course, the European Green Deal and the regulatory changes in energy and in environmental tax uh, uh, areas in general. The new guidelines include compatibility rules for clean mobility infrastructure and bi biodiversity. Biodiversity was also especially mentioned yesterday by Esther, which is very important and non, uh, it's not uh, very frequently uh, focus uh, on, on, on this kind of conferences. And finally, uh, includes also the compatibility rules for resource efficiency to support the transition towards a circular economy. There is a great connection on the, uh, on the guidelines 
climate, with climate change and circular economy as two drivers to take into consideration. Of course, the guidelines are a very, very long one, as always we know in the, in the Guidelines Commission. What are the most important changes? Uh, as we can, uh, we can see in the, in the web page of the Commission, this is no my, my, uh, uh, it's not for, um, for, for, for my invention, but it's, it's taken this, uh, this important change from the web page of the European Commission. First of all, the, the most important changes is that the scope of the application of, uh, of, uh, of the rules was enlarged to enable support new areas. Secondly, the new guidelines uh, increase flexibility and streamlining the existing rules by introducing a simplified assessment. We need simplified approach. We need clarity. We need to facilitate the, the, the rules and the application of the rules, uh, but that of cross-cutting measures and also this uh, increase of flexibility uh, was, was uh, improved by eliminating the requirements for individual notification of large green projects. That's also important. Thirdly, uh, the, mm, the new guidelines introduce safeguards to ensure that the aid is effectively direct where it is necessary to improve climate, non-green washing and environmental protection. And finally, new guidelines try to ensure coherence with the relevant European legislation and policies in the environmental and energy fields. For example, by phasing out subsidies for fossil fuels and coal and whatever. What are the challenges for modernization for, for, for in this process of modernization to, to better address uh, climate change targets. The new guidelines will have to facilitate appropriate measures for their promotion, promoting a modern decarbonized and circular economy while ensuring limited distortion to, of competition and adequate safeguard to the integrity of the single market. The single market, of course, is always present. Uh, my colleague um, Alvar Anton will uh, address uh, in, 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 uh, in his speech, in his presentation, which is the rationale of the new guidelines, the state aid framework, and the energy taxation directive, uh, supporting uh, this, his presentation with some uh, interesting cases and recent cases. Um, this is key, given the past the past experiences, and most crucially, future budgetary constraints combined with the necessity to support the recovery of the European Union economy in the aftermath of the coronavirus crisis. crisis. Uh, in, the, in the final day, Professor Geronimo and, and myself will address this, uh, this kind of combination of, 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 uh, of public aid for economic recovery too. Um, there is new sections on the, on the recent guidelines uh, in the categorization of aids. No, I, I, I uh, also, I only mentioned in, on this slide, uh, section 4.1, aid for reduction or removal of green, greenhouse gases. This is important to support renewable energies and technologies. Theoretically, guidelines are neutral with technologies, theoretically we should focus on, on what is say on, on, on each category. The second category uh, addressed the aid for improvement of energy performance of buildings, uh, aid for clean mobility, aid for risk price efficiency and transition to circular economy. We have aid for prevention or reduction of pollution and other green gas, uh, greenhouse gases. And finally, aid for remediation of environmental damage, rehabilitation of natural habitats, protection of biodiversity and nature-based solution to climate change. Let me uh, say some, some more details on the section uh, four and seven 
which address tax reduction and exemptions for environmental taxes and parafiscal levies. I have underlined this because it's important that uh, the new guidelines mention specifically parafiscal level levies. We have a lot of cases of uh, financial aids in a non-transparent way in the in an, uh, electricity system in, in, Euro, in, in, in Europe and in, in most of the, of the states. Uh, as uh, the previous guidelines um, um, have, have uh, mentioned, there is uh, a distinction between the assessment on harmonized environmental taxes and non-harmonized environmental taxes. Uh, in the first case, the necessity and the proportionality, the proportionality test is simplified. It's possible to have rate reductions and tax reimbursement, uh, but there is a need to pay at least the, the minimum tax level under the energy directive, uh, taxation directive. It's important to remark that always energy taxation directive and state aids are connected, are really directly connected. Uh, beneficiary uh, should base uh, on objective and transparent criteria to, um, to avoid that uh, there is uh, no uh, right beneficiary uh, having been helped by, by the state. And we also should prove that similar conditions are uh, applied for all competitors. The, this is also uh, important to, to assure the, the test of the comparability of the, uh, of the polluters we can say of the, or, or as well as activity, polluters activities. In the case of non-harmonized environmental taxes, like ta carbon taxes or emission certificates, uh, there is a need to prove that uh, there is the, the aid pursue one of the objective refers in other sections. Uh, that means that the assessment uh, is, um, is not simplified on the new guidelines. Uh, we, can, uh, we can also learn from the new guidelines that there is a special section for aids in the form of reduction in tax or parafiscal level, for example, in, in the corporate income tax. Uh, and in this case, uh, the new guidelines uh, should re require that uh, these aids uh, pursue one of the objective refer on this uh, section, and there is a need to, uh, uh, to, to demonstrate that the proportionality test is, uh, is applied, incentive effect, avoidance of due negative effect of competition and trade, and the, the general requirements as, as we are uh, aware of. Um, now, let me say something very brief about the relation of state aids uh, in, and, and the energy taxation directive. I mentioned that there is a direct link. Uh, this direct link is uh, expressly um, stated in Article 26. Uh, we can read on that article that measures of such uh, tax exemptions, tax reduction, tax differentiation, and tax reforms within the meaning of this directive might constitute state aid. And in those cases must, not, must be notified by the commission. The energy taxation directive lays down European rules for the taxation of energy products used as a motor fuel or heating fuel and of electricity. Energy taxation directive, as you all know, are under revision now in the so-called Fit for 55 package. And tomorrow we have Elena Maseglia, Maseglia uh, that uh, uh, address specifically the content on the energy taxation directive. That's mean that, that that's all from, from my part. Uh, let me say that uh, there is also some statements, interesting statements in the general block exemption regulation, uh, which uh, provide a simplified approach in the case of harmony taxes. This is uh, contained in Article 45. 44 have um, 
as it is established in this article, eight schemes in the form of reduction in environmental taxes fulfilling the condition of the Energy Taxation Directive shall be compatible with the internal market and exempted from the notification requirement. In this case, the beneficiary shall be selected on the basis of transparent and objective criteria and shall pay at least the respective minimum level of taxation set by the European Taxation Directive which means in some states one tax, in other states two different figures. In any case, the general block essential regulation has assimilated the concept of environmental tax and harmonized energy tax for the purpose of the exemption from the notification requirement. We have uh, researched a lot uh, in, uh, on this particular issue because in the end, this automatic uh, consideration uh, can be good or can be bad. It depends on, the, on which uh, tax are you considering. Uh, let me finalize my presentation uh, with, with, uh, with uh, an important topic to me to better understand the decisions from the Commission and the uh, judgment from the European Court of Justice, the nature of the European Union legal concept. Let me remark that the nature of a tax, duty or charge must be determined by the court under the European law, according to the objective characteristics by which it is leveled, irrespective of its classification under national tax law. It is not at all well understood by the states. And let me uh, only uh, quote some specific uh, cases that show the importance and the practical, uh, and the practical effects of, of this consideration. In the case Fondazione Santa Lucia, the Italian government considered that the amounts covering general electricity charges are not fiscal one, but relating to pricing, since they have covered through the components of the electricity tariff. But on paragraph 14 of the, this uh, judgment, the European Court of Justice uh, takes the consideration that the amount covering general electricity charge constitute indirect taxation within the meaning of the Energy Taxation Directive. That means that the assessment is made under the, the directive. Even if the, if the Italian government are convinced, is convinced that uh, there are no fiscal measures. In a, in a, a Spanish case, Promociones Oliva Park, which, um, which, uh, in which one the European Court of Justice say yes to the tax of 7% to the energy production in Spain, which is called Impuesto sobre el Valor de la Producción de Energía Eléctrica, is not an indirect tax, which is levied directly or indirectly on the consumption of electricity covered by the Energy Taxation Directive. And the arguments are the same, but on the first case, there is considered energy taxation directive under the scope, and the second case, no. Uh, in the case Transporte Jordi Besora, the um, Court of Justice have decided which requirements are needed to qualify a tax as an environmental tax. It is required that all the elements of the tax are connected to the environment, not only the tax base or the tax, the tax, uh, the tax uh, effect. Uh, regarding parafiscal levies, we have the interesting case, Austria versus Commission, in this case, is also connected with the financing of electricity system, which is always very, 
not non-transparent, not so transparent. We have cross subsidies. It's very complex to 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 really understand how how it's functioning. And Austria has the same very similar uh, regulation uh, as as uh, as Germany, but in Germany the Court of Justice say yes, it is in compliance with the European law, and in Austria case say no. And to me, the most important thing is that in, the, in this case, the Court of Justice does not uh, consider uh, the possibility to apply analogy. This morning, we, ha we have spoken about analogy, and Geronimo mentioned that uh, in order to, to, to promote better regulation on, on the competition policy. No? But in this case, there is no more sense to use analogy. And, then, and that means that uh, states don't have don't have really legal certainty to to assure that uh, its uh, regulation and its financial framework is in compliance with state aid regulation. Final remarks: two more slides. A green recovery will require systematic integration of environmental update consideration. The fiscal responses to the pandemic provide an opportunity to adopt the smartest measures for a just and green recovery. It sounds great, this is serious. What are the main challenges? To find out how and where tax measure can bolster sustainable development. It is so difficult as to include sustainability in competition policy. Other challenges, how to move from theory to practice and how to improve governance issues in all the dimensions. Green transformation in any case requires technological innovation, environmental taxation to internalize climate change costs, investment in infrastructure. This is very important that accelerates the energy taxation, the energy transition. And finally, we need innovation innovation in technologies, innovation with merger or non-merger, with agreements or no agreement, but we need innovation towards a more efficient production processes. With these final remarks, the question should be, are the state aid rules contributing to these climate change priorities? Some state aids, for example, the ones, uh, already in force for coal, for fossil fuels, creates financial barriers for renewable energy. And we need to increase the presence of renewable energy in the mix of energy, of, of electricity. The state aid general assessment on tax incentive remains. The reference system, the derogation, justification by the nature of the scheme of the system, which means we should have external and internal consistency. And I have to say that the compatibility under the new guidelines has improved the situation because we need of a state intervention. Of course, in this specific uh, uh, crisis, economic crisis moment, but we need to assure that this uh, state intervention is appropriate. It has uh, incentive effect and it's, uh, and, and it's uh, also in compliance with the proportionality requirements. And of course, it's transparency. Transparency, we need transparency also in, in all the policies, but also in the state aid framework. And finally, is the new guidelines, uh, are the new guidelines an ambiguous, uh, an ambiguous approach to fossil fuels as it is allowed? in the process to, to, to get the 2030 or 50 or 70 targets. This is all from my part. Uh, here you have some references, which are the result of uh, other interesting uh, projects uh, that have linked uh, state aids. That's mean competition, my colleague, uh, uh, Geronimo Maillo, taxation, that is my subject, of course, and the energy sector. We all together have learned a lot about the energy sector within this project. And on the other part of the slide, you can see 
uh, two books that was um, that have been published uh, at the beginning of our research, uh, and and this uh, first book was translated into Chinese. I think it was uh, very amazing to put on the on the slide the the book in in Chinese. We 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 have feel very proud to have it. And that's all for my part. And, and I, uh, I, uh, I'm ready to, to learn uh, from my colleague Alvaro Anton new cases that uh, can show the importance of these specific issues. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Marta, for that. Uh, um, whenever I hear an expert talking about a subject in this way, I realize how impossible it is to be a generalist in European Union law anymore. One subject, so dense, so complex, and so important. So that was really very valuable. And I'm very pleased to say that Marta gave me a copy of the book in English rather than in uh, Mandarin. So that is uh, very fortunate indeed. And thank you very much for that. So with your agreement, Marta, we will go to Alvaro and then take questions and discussion after that. Does that seem the best way to proceed? I, I would appreciate if you habilitate me the possibility of sharing the screen, please. We are going to, to close my presentation and now I think you are allowed to, to share your presentation, Alvaro. Great. Thank you. One moment, I don't know if you are looking there. Oh. Wow. Pantalla, Álvaro. Are you you have to move to total screen? Yes. Okay. Now Great. Uh, could you please uh, uh, put the presentation in full view? It's not in full view. No, if you have another screen, uh, you yes. have to swap the screen. In the other screen, you will see uh, um, on, the, um, on the top of the screen, you will see swap screen is an option. Okay, okay, let me, let me, in the top of the screen. Yes, you will see in the, in the other screen where you, where you see the... Um, now? No, no. No, it's no. the same. Oh. Okay. Or maybe, maybe you can stop the sharing put the, the presentation in full screen mode and then start the share again. Okay, let me, a moment, let me, maybe if I do that, uh, a moment. No problem, we have enough time, Alvaro. No, a moment because I think the problem is that I wonder if, if he sends us the PowerPoint and we- No, the, just maybe it's, it's just. No. Or maybe if you don't need the other screen, no. you can now, one more unplug the screen, the second screen. If you unplug the second screen, you can use the, the presentation uh, like normal. Well, now I think the computer is blocked. So now we have a problem. Oof. Okay, I think now it's, I'm gonna make it now. Now? It's okay? Yeah. Bravo, Alvaro. Uh, okay, okay. So, uh, 
please click on um, configuración de visualización. Ok. Eh, cambiar entrevista, moderador y presentación. Exactamente. Perfect, Álvaro, you can start. Great. Ok, thank you. Sorry for this uh, 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 little delay. Well, as, as uh, Professor uh, Villar stated, uh, my, my presentation is going to uh, try to make some sense uh, under the, the state aid uh, regulation concerning uh, environmental taxation. Because, well, there is some key issues in the in the application of the state aid law well that is not uh, for for foreigners or for people who are that are not used to to uh, the the way the the commission and the court assess some elements of the of the state aid uh, measures that can be a little bit tricky a little bit difficult and in some points somehow it's, it's better to to explain with some practical examples even though in these examples is also um, well they are difficult as i was saying to 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 understand Hello, sorry for bothering you but you should uh, we don't hear you very well maybe okay i think i have a solution also for that so that, that, that that's perfect now i think let me, let me maybe if i Now? Now, now? now it's perfect. Now, well, I will do it with the, the microphone. <laughs> I was, I was uh, saying that some, some points of the stated law, stated uh, assessment, is, is, they are quite tricky, are quite complicated because they don't always same, uh, follow the same logic. And this is a special. Uh, Clear, especially uh, spe specific and specific issue in the case of, well, the assessment of some uh, environmental tax measures. As mm, Professor Villar was saying, well, the concept of, of a state aid is the, is, well, a state aid is any aid granted by the member state or through a state resources in any form whatsoever, which distorts or threatens to distort, to distort competition by favoring certain undertakings or the productions of certain god goods in so far as it affects trade between member states with this concept one thing one important uh, uh, question about this uh, issue about this uh, definition is that we have to understand that the notion of state aid is an objective and legal concept on the one hand, that means that while well, the Commission is bound by this objective notion and therefore enjoys a limited margin of discretion in applying it. And also implies that the concept, the notion, and this is quite important, the notion of a state aid does not distinguish between uh, measures of state intervention in terms or of their causes or aims, but defines them in relation to their effects. Independently, as Professor Biller stated, independently of the techniques used. Doesn't matter if it's a, a tax measure or a direct grant, but the important thing is when we analyze, we, when we assess the concept of state aid, we have to put, first of all, on one side, the objective pursued by the measure. When we will um, take into account the objective, when we analyze, when we assess the uh, compatibility of the aid with the market, but not in the moment of qualification, the moment of the qualification of a measure as a state aid. But this is a little bit, this is more or less, this is the theory, the, 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 the in theory, manuals, textbooks will say that this is the, the thing that the objective uh, of the measure 
it doesn't matter that we are not taking into account the objective of the measure. But this is, in recent years, this is not true. This is not completely true. Because when we assess one of the elements of the eight, specifically the reference, the selectivity of the measure, in some cases, we have to take into account the objective of the measure, as I will explain in this uh, presentation. I'm not going to go deeply about the, the verification, well, the, the some aspect that Professor Villar also uh, already explained, but, well, um, the concept of, of state aid is, is a broad one, objective one, and once the, the the a measure that potentially be can be qualified as the, as a state aid, we know that member states have to uh, notify in a mandatory way, a mandatory notification to the European Commission, and the European Commission uh, has to assess the the measure, and the Commission has to decide if the measure met the four accumulative criteria derived from Article 107.1. There are some exemptions about the, uh, of this um, prior mandatory notification as aid covered by block exemption, as the minimum aid, that is aids that not exceeding 200,000 uh, Euro, uh, euros per undertaking over any period of three fiscal years, or aid granted under an aid scheme already authorized by the Commission. Outside these uh, exemptions, a member of state must wait for the Commission decision before they can put a measure into effect. And as I say, I was saying there are four elements and perhaps one of the most difficult elements to, to assess is the selective, uh, selectivity uh, element, of the element of the selectivity. In this case, because otherwise it will be too long, we, we are going to focus in the material selectivity. And material selectivity of a measure implies that the measure applies only to certain groups or undertakings or certain sectors of the economy in a given member state. Material selectivity can be established de jure or de facto, but um, material selectivity is, is the notion of, of, of material selectivity is the one who more or less always applying to the, applies to the case of environmental taxes or environmental measures. The other uh, type of selectivity is regional selectivity, but we are not going to open this door, that door today, otherwise we'll be here <laughs> all the afternoon. So we are going to focus in the material selectivity. And the material selectivity, well, um, has an assessment when, especially when they take the form of tax exemptions, exemptions that we call it the three-step analysis. And the, and the three-step uh, analysis, when we assess the material selectivity of a measure uh, that uh, meet, uh, well, which by concept, what a material aid does is to mitigate the normal charges of one undertaking. When we assess the material selectivity, we apply this three step analysis. This uh, analysis, the first step of this uh, analysis is to identify the reference system. Uh, second, it we should be determine whether a given measure constitutes a derogation from that system is so far as, is, as it is differentiated different differentiates sorry between economic operators who in light of the objective intrinsic to the system are in comparable factual and legal situation assess 
whether a derogation exists is the key element of this part of the text and allows to the commission a conclusion to be drawn as to whether the measure is or not prima facie selective. Derogation from the system of reference therefore implies to uh, somehow take into account the objective of the measure of the system as we will explain now it's important to have to take into account the objective of the of the measure in in, in this uh, sense as you can say you can see in the in the in the screen when reference is made to the nature of the normal system it is the objective attributed attributed to that system which is being referred to. Whereas when the general structure of the normal system is mentioned, reference is being, being, being made to its rules of taxation. Generally, when we talk about environmental taxes or when we're talking about environmental measure, we have to take into account the objective attributed to that system because if the objective attributed to that system is to collect revenues, is a fiscal purpose, like a broad energy tax, which its objective is to tax all forms of energies because they have a, a, a collection, a collecting, collection of, of revenues purpose, a fiscal uh, finality. Therefore, the objective will be is, is, is going to be difficult to 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 justify a desviation of the of the objective um, under environmental grounds on the other hand we can we may find measures that have the, the the measure itself has a environmental goal like for example a renewable energy support schemes or a environmental tax that the objective is to achieve an environmental goal is an obje uh, environmental objective and therefore when we assess the derogation from the system we have to take into account the environmental objective the environmental nature of the measure so it's important at this point to differentiate between well, the tax measure has environmental purpose by itself, or it pursues a non-environmental purpose, because this is, is somehow going to be the key in order to assess the derogation from the system or not. Precisely, if the measure is uh, justified by this objective, the measure is going to be uh, consider as um, justified by the nature of the general scheme of the system and therefore the commission is going to consider that the measure is not selective. For example, if we uh, establish an environmental tax on CO2 or, uh, or carbon, a carbon tax, the objective of the carbon tax is to tax all forms of electricity, energy products, which produce this um, kind of, 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 of environmental problem. Therefore, in the logic of the system, the inherent logic of the system is to not tax, is not to not subject to taxation to renewable energy products, to products from solar uh, with a sol solar origin or a wind uh, uh, power origin, this is justified by the system. Therefore, the, the measure is never going to be considered as selective. Therefore, we have these three uh, step analysis. And as I said, the derogation from the system of reference is one of the key issues when considering the assessment of the selectivity and in this case and as that's why i i, I highlight in, in green the structure of certain special purposes levels levies and particular the tax basis of some 
levies, such as, for example, environmental taxes, imposed to discourage certain activities or products that have an adverse effect on the environment, will normally integrate the policy objective for should. Therefore, in such cases, a differentiated treatment for activities or products whose situation is different from the situation of those activities or products with are, which are subject to the tax as regard the intrinsic objective pursues don't, does not constitute a derogation. Therefore, it is clear in these cases that the objective of the system are being taken into account, even though in the, in the first slide, we were saying that the objective of the measure doesn't have a relevance when we assess the, 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 the existence of or not of, of, of an aid. But the reality is that recent uh, uh, evolution of the, of the decision of the Commission, the, the evolution of the, of the case law of the European Court shows us that nowadays to have a clear idea of the objective of the measure is vital in order to consider a measure, a fiscal measure as a state aid or not in the field of environmental uh, policy. For example, to see, trying to explain a little bit better with some uh, practical examples, we have a judgment a court decision from the uh, general court regarding a, a support to uh, renewable energy, a renewable energy support aid scheme, schemes, considering well, which grant an a selective a selective advantage to producers of wind, solar, hydroelectric, biomass therefore renewable energies. The aim of the support was to increase the share of renewable energy generated from uh, renewable energies. And therefore it was in line with the uh, European objective. In this point, it's also important to point out that we cannot justify a measure on the grounds that the measure is uh, designed to achieve a European objective. It's not enough. Again, the specific aims of the aid in that cases are, have to be taken into account in a second phase where we assess the compatibility of the measures with the internal market, but not at this point. In fact, this system was Consider was found by the, the, the Commission as stated because the, the system as such consists in a fitting premium or fitting tariff uh, granted to these uh, uh, renewable energy producers and therefore it grant a, an advantage that was selective as electricity producers. Uh, not all electricity producers receive the aid, only a producer from a renewable origin, and the commission considers that the aid is selective, it grants an advantage, and these uh, companies, the renewable energy producers, are in a situation factually and legal comparable to that of other electricity producers. Therefore, the system as such is a state aid. But what happened with this system is that this system was financed through a levy. And this levy was imposed not in produce on, on, on producers of electricity, but on end electricity consumers on the basis of their electricity, electricity consumption. Therefore, we can distinguish two elements of this system. One is the RES schemes to support producers, 
and then a levy imposed to generate income, to generate resources to finance in order to finance the system. The problem was that the Lithuanian um, authorities introduced five exemptions into the levy. These exemptions one was uh, were aimed to the electricity produced by plants using our renewable energy and consumed for their own needs, the electricity which was necessary for combined production of heat and electricity, the electricity pushed by networks operators to compensate for natural losses of electricity to the grid, the electricity produced by a small air ice uh, renewable energy producers and the electricity which was consumed by data processing and internet server services. Then we have to be clear the Lithuanian system was made out following three measures a fit in premium, supplement on the top of the portion price of electricity for renewable energy producers and fit in tariff for a smaller uh, energy, uh, renewable energy producers. Two, second element, a compensation of electricity producers for the connection cost. And third element, exemption of renewable energy producers from the electricity balancing obligation. This was an aid. This is clear that it's an aid, but the problem was with the levy introduced to finance to, to obtain the, the financial resources to implement the aid. And regarding this um, exemption introduced in the levy, the commission assess in a separate way the levy itself and separate the levy from the RAS, the, the system to, rene to, to, the, to, to, to finance renewable energy. So the, the, the commission make a differentiation, made a difference between the, the system su to support producers and the mechanisms to obtain the financial resources to uh, obtain the resources to the to the to the uh, renewable energy uh, prom promote system or seen and the commission applied the three steps to all the exemptions to the um, of the introduced in the levy. And the commission applying the three-step assessment consider that the four, uh, the, the first four uh, exemptions were somehow a state aid in the sense that they were selective, they, they consider no, they, they, they were an advantage to some uh, undertakings. They consider that prima facie were selective as they provide a derogation for certain electricity consumers from the obligation to pay the levy. Um, but the commission considered that these measures were justified by the logic and nature of the system. Whereas the, five, the fifth uh, exemption, the commission considered that it was an state aid in they, they, they meet all the accumulative criteria, and it was not uh, justified by the nature, natural of the system. But the commission considered the four first uh, exemptions were well selective, were advantage, but the selectivity was justified by the nature of the system. The problem here is that, as the general court stated, that the commission was not taking into account the intrinsic objective of the system. And if the intrinsic objective of the system is to promote renewable energies, you cannot exclude from the levy producers uh, of fossil fuel, fossil fuel producers. Because some of these um, exemptions, such as the one uh, to uh, the electricity which, which was necessary for combined production of heat electricity or uh, the electricity purchased by networks operator to compensate for natural losses, they don't distinguish between renewable energy 
consumers or producers and fossil fuels producers. Therefore, the levy, uh, the, the, the exemption didn't take into account the inherent logic of the system. And the inherent logic of the system was an environmental one, was an environmental policy. It was to promote renewable energies. Therefore, it's not justified by the intrinsic nature of this system to, again, exempt from the levy a producer which awards a behavior, behavior, a, 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 well, a with, with a worst effect in the in the environment from the, 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 this point of view. Therefore, in these cases, the court take into account the objective attributed to the system as a whole, the renewable energy system and the levy, and assess the selectivity taking into account the um, environmental objective of the system and under this uh, under that uh, system of course it don't make sense to exclude the most polluters uh, producers we have a second example in the case of the energy tax directive which is the opposite Regarding of what we might think, the energy tax directive is not an environmental tax as such. It's a system of harmonization from energy taxation in the EU, but it doesn't introduce a real environmental inherent logic. The, inner, the energy tax directive of Professor Avillar State is a, is a framework to the harmonization of the taxation of energy products and electricity. And as is stated in the recital 22 of the energy tax directive, the energy, according to the directive, energy products should be essentially be subject to a community framework when used as heating fuels or motor fuels. To that extent, it is in the nature and the logic of the tax system to exclude from the a scope of the framework dual uses as a non fuel uses of energy products as well as mineralogical process. Electricity used in a similar way should be treated on an equal footing. In the recital 22, we can see that, in fact, the logic, the inner logic of the energy tax directive is to, 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 to tax all forms of energy regardless of the environmental component, of the environmental uh, behavior, of the environmental impact. Therefore, according to the inner logic of the energy tax directive, renewable energy products should be also taxed. According to the inner logic of the directive, therefore, the inner logic Log, uh, logic of this directive, the true inner logic of this directive is to collect revenues and protect the internal market. But when we assess the selectivity of a measure introduced in the context of this directive, we cannot defend in a proper way the existence of a real, um, well, somehow the system of, of a justification but the natural of the of the inherent nature of the system, because we are talking about, uh, as I was saying, a directive that doesn't have a true environmental component. They, it doesn't introduce a real environmental component in the EU energy tax system. The Commission itself has indicated that the energy tax directive, uh, well it doesn't provide environmental purpose. And in fact, when we assess the directive, we find that the tax treatment of renewable fuels under the energy tax directive is not adapted to their characteristics and any adaptation can only take the form of optional detaxation subject to a strict state aid assessment. 
in particular, standard taxation of renewable fuels is based on volume and on the rate applicable to the fossil product replaced by the renewable product concern. Therefore, the energy tax directive standard tax treatment is not adapted to the characteristics of renewable fuels and any adaptation can only take the form of optional tax exemption subject to a street state assessment. Sorry, I, I repeat that. Um, th that means that um, we have an, an instrument, an economic instrument, which could be used to achieve an environmental a climate objective and an EU objective fight against climate change, promote renewable energies. We can align this uh, energy tax directive to achieve the Green Deal, European Green Deal objective, but the structure, no, the, the, the current structure is not adapted to this, um, to this uh, environmental goals. Member states are the ones who have to introduce tax measures in the form of the taxation of the form of exemption of the form of uh, different tax rates in order to introduce a real environmental component in the directive. But when we assess the, uh, for example, exemption introduced in the energy tax directive to promote renewable energies, we have to forget in this case about the environmental objective because the commission, when assessed the selectivity of these tax exemptions is only gonna take into account the inherent logic of the energy tax directive. And the inherent logic of the energy tax directive is not to protect the environment, but to guarantee the correct function of the internal market and to collect revenues. And from the, that point of view, uh, is not, is not going to be um, justified by the natural or the inner and natural of the system a desviation, uh, even though this that desviation is uh, is included to uh, achieve an environmental goal. We we have several uh, cases. Al, 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 Alvaro, yes, can, we're we're starting to run out of time. So if I could yes. ask you to begin to wind up your presentation so of there's course. a little bit of time for discussion as well yes for sure thank you very much we have this example in article uh, 16 to promote uh, biofuels included in the directive we could be think or we could be argued that the tax reduction for biofuels is not a state aid because it is covered by exemption contained in the in a EU directive well, we can think that, but the problem is that, as the Commission and the, and the Court recognize, uh, the Commission recalls that this competence on stated issues originate directly from the treaty, and therefore any, any EU legislation cannot possibly impair the Commission competence in these fields. Though, th therefore, we have to take into account that even in those cases, uh, aid can, uh, a measure can be considered a state aid. Again, we consider that in this case, we cannot take into account an environmental objective of the measure, but the inner and logic of the measure, and according to the inner and logic attributed to the energy tax directive, a desviation of the directive to promote biofuels can be considered, or any kind of energy, renewable energy, can be considered as a state aid. Although this, uh, in, in in the first case, when we were talking about the levy, or in the second case, when we talk talking about uh, measures introducing the energy tax directive, we cannot consider, especially in the second case, maybe we cannot consider the objective when assess the, the aid, but these objectives can be taken into account when we assess the compatibility of the aid with the internal market. As Marta uh, Villar, as the Professor Villar explained, the community guidelines, I'm going to escape that. Only uh, take into account that the current uh, guidelines distinguish between three groups of tax 
measures, with environmental goals, not two, but three, because a point one, uh, the, the, the section 4.7 includes two separate kind of measures. One, form, uh, aids in the form of, on reduction in environmental taxes and parafiscal levies, and the second category of this uh, point uh, 4.7 uh, they include aid for environmental protection in the form of reductions in taxes or parafiscal level. It's not the same. We are, we are in, in the second, um, in, in the first case, we are talking about measures introduced in order to be able to introduce uh, higher taxes, but at the same time protecting some companies undertaken or sector, we can be more exposed to the increment of, of tax rate for environmental purpose. And in the, same, in the second case, we are talking more about a, a, a measure that takes the form of exemption, but in, in, in the rationality is the same of a direct grant. And in, in, the, sec, in the section 4.11, uh, we found the eight in the form of reduction from electricity levies from energy intact intensive uses. And this is precisely the case we were talking about in the first example, the, in the case of the uh, levy introduced by uh, Lithuania in the context of his RSS scenes. We are talking about uh, exemption introduced in a levy, a levy introduced to finance a uh, environmental mechanisms. And, Therefore, the commission for this kind of measure include a specific sentence. And the third element and last element that I will take into account, we assess the, the selectivity, but sometimes we have to take into account always also that the measures is not only have to be selectivity and grant and advance, but has to be, in, has to be inputable to the state in the, in the sense that the, the state has to um, be the responsible or, or the ones who uh, the, 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 the ones have introduced the date. And in this sense, the fact that a measure is achieving an a environmental objective is not enough to, to, to a European environmental objective is not enough to argue that the measure is not imputable to the state. It, it has some specific elements that has to be met. For example, a measure is not imputable to a member state if the member state is under an obligation to implement it under union law. When we talk about directive that introduce a environmental objective, as we know, directive don't apply to the, to the mechanism, but to the, to the to the goal itself. So um, it is difficult somehow to, to is, is, is quite common to, 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 to confuse, confuse the, the fact that the EU introduced an obligation, a climate obligation, an environmental obligation, to the fact that, that this measure is not imputable to the state, because normally it is. When it's not going to be easy, the, the example is, for example, when we uh, attend or, or we assess the, the proposal to modify the energy tax directive. When we assess the modification, the proposal to modify the energy tax directive, we, 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 we realize that the commission is proposing an introduction of different tax rates depending of the environmental performance of each energy product. That means that energy products with a better environmental performance will have a better tax treatment and therefore an advantage. And this advantage is going to be selective because it's only going to be granted to uh, renewable energy producers. But however, the measure is not going to be imputable to the state because the state in this case don't, doesn't have any, any uh, uh, kind of, of, of discretionality in order to apply these measures. Though, th therefore, this is also an element that we have to take into account when uh, assessment, when we assess the, 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 a measure that to be considered and stated under the EU tax law. 
and with that I I leave the floor for for comments comments and and, and questions. Thank you. So thank you very much, um, Dr. Anton. And now we have a little bit of time for comments and questions and discussions. So let me first of all open the floor to people who are online. If anybody online would like to ask a question or make a comment. And if not, then I will ask those of us in the room. And uh, perhaps I'll abuse my position as chair by, by asking the first question, um, which is a, a very general question from somebody who doesn't work at all in, in, in this area. So I was very interested to hear Marta uh, present as context for the discussion, the, the idea of just transition. So my question is, when the EU makes decisions on state aids in relation to environmental issues, does it also take in, into account the social, potential social consequences of the project? So for example, you mentioned large infrastructure projects, or we might think of biofuel projects. So does the commission take into account the concept of just transition and the impact on workers and on local communities in particular when it's um, making its decisions on state aids? Thank you very much for this interesting question. The, the answer uh, to me is not, because the assessment is made uh, using these very detailed and specific uh, requirements under the Article 107 and the specific case law and assessment under each requirement and each category. Uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Anton, explained with a, with a, a very complex example the difficulties when the assessment is made under the regime of a fiscal or non-fiscal harmonized or non-harmonized uh, tax. And, and the, the assessment made by the Commission and in the end by the European Court of Justice uh, consider the rational and the criteria of the objective of the measure, if it's fiscal or is environmental one. And it is not considered under the first step analysis, but on the second one. And, and uh, sometimes uh, economic uh, constraints uh, are argued by, uh, by the states to justify the measures. And uh, the, there is a very a strict uh, uh, applicability of, of, of those conditions, but uh, social considerations are uh, more political than, uh, than uh, real uh, applicated in, into the assessment of this specific, uh, specifically and complex uh, complex uh, cases. Uh, I, 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 I would like to, to, uh, to read, uh, to, to read and, and, and to, um, uh, to, to, to be these considerations uh, in the future, but at the moment it is not uh, that, that uh, we, we can learn from, from the practical application of the rules. In, Thank you. That's in, very, in, very helpful. In the case of state aid, we have to, to take into account when we, we talk about social consideration that a state only applies to undertakings, so not to, to consumers. Though, in somehow, a member state could introduce some this kind of, of measures without a, a, a commission control. That's one thing. And the, the other element is, is, is clear, is what a, Professor Villar explained the problem is that, of course, all all of the measures, in especially in the in the field of environmental taxation, are introduced in order to compensate this uh, company, this undertaking that can be exposed to a higher risk of of this this localization of or loss of competitiveness, which can affect 
local labors who, who can affect the, uh, the, the, the local lo, uh, uh, state uh, economy. But the problem is that the system is quite complex when we, we, we escape from a simpler, the, 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 when we go into deeper assessment of, of a exemption of a, from an energy tax or environmental tax, the, 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 the way to prove the necessity of, and the proportionality is quite difficult. And it's going to be more difficult if, the, if the, finally the, the Commission introduced the, 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 board, the, the carbon tax uh, adjustment the, the, sorry the, because in, in, in that's going to be used by the commission to to argue that the well that the, the, the tax exemption or, or tax mitigation measure is not necessary and is not proportionate and is not justified because it already exists a, a mechanism in the European context that avoid this loss of competitiveness. So if the, 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 the tax border adjustment is, is finally approved, I think it's going to be harder, even harder, to introduce this kind of state aids. So, so that's a wonderful segue into our topic for tomorrow, the carbon border mm -hmm. adjustment mechanism. Um, I'm going to give the last uh, question to Geronimo because I'm very conscious that we want to finish not too late, um, also because we have our technician here only for a certain period of time. So, Geronimo, the last question is for you. Thank you very much. Just a comment on the previous issue that you have been discussing. I wonder what will happen if a state notifies a, 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 the European Commission at Ed, not only with an environmental purpose, but also with a social purpose. If that's the case, it might be that then you have to enter into both. Um, but if you notify and then only on their environmental or energy, then then I don't think I, I, I fully agree with you that usually social considerations are, are not uh, taken into account. But if the estate doubles the purpose, the goal, then the commission will have to enter into that as well. Um, and so that might be a, an exception to the general rule. Um, and my question uh, relates to general trends. Um, and we have seen this morning that uh, the guidelines, the new draft guidelines on horizontal cooperation agreements uh, is under review and is, um, there are still very contradictory positions on, on it. So my, my question is, what is your feeling in the state aid, both uh, Marta and Alvaro, uh, with the, regard to the new guidelines? Have they been very controversial or, or, or do you think that uh, uh, there was a, a, a high consensus on, on, on what to, to do? Um, uh, what is your feeling uh, about it? So can I ask you to keep your answers relatively short? And I hope we can carry on the discussion in sessions tomorrow and the next day as well. Of course, thank you. My, my sense is that uh, this is a legal question, but, but political one. Therefore, that means there is no consensus at, at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, that uh, the winners are on the guidelines and the losers are not on the on the guidelines. This is my perception. I don't know if uh, my colleague is uh, agree with me. Or, yeah, yeah. Or I you. think I think that this guideline has been approved in a context with uh, that is with the next next generation funds and with the relaxation of the state aid rules. And therefore, it's I think it's somehow more simple to 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 from a political point of view to approve uh, this, this guideline, maybe is the ones that more easily have been approved with less uh, uh, controversial. But we have to see in the future, once the, 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 the transitional measure disappears and the, well, with the, in the context of the next generation funds, we have to, to, 
to check the guidelines in that context. Not now, it's quite difficult to to assess to make an assessment. And one last point we have to regarding to the first question regarding with the, the, the question we were talking about social consideration, we have to, to just to, to make to be precise, when we talk about this kind of measure, we are talking about the exemption provided by Article uh, 107, uh, uh, three letter letter C. If we're talking about other consideration, the legal basis of the of the of the, the the A to be declared compatible should change. Maybe we we must take a, speak about letter A or letter um, B, D, but not C. So the legal basis are different, and that is important also to to point out. Just to add, if I can, uh, Jan, to answer a bit more your question about social consideration, there would be a possibility uh, with the assessment of the use of resources. The use of resources can be for helping the companies again, and then uh, there will be also under another articles on the treaty because of the discrimination of the system, the exaction uh, defect equivalente, the uh, quantitative measure. Yeah, yeah. This brings us to the uh, session of tomorrow. I think. Thank you very much. So we have got these wonderful segues into tomorrow's and um, session, which is really wonderful. And the just transition throws into the air all our different paragraphs, and we don't know where they're going to settle and fall, I suspect, at this point. It's a very, very interesting topic. So this has been a really stimulating session. I've learned a huge amount from it, so I'd like to thank uh, Marta and Alvaro um, very much for their presentations and our audience members, dedicated audience members still sitting online and enjoying the summer school. So we look forward to seeing everybody again tomorrow starting at 10 a.m. And thanks again uh, to our technician and apologies for the delay and Francesca, as always, for her help.